3,000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3,000 Podcast. I'm joined today by a rapper and the self-proclaimed mayor of the Paran Flats, Little Jace. Thanks for coming, man. What's going on, Maloney? <laughs> is that a uh, yeah. fitting introduction yeah, for Yeah, that's you? it. That's the one. That's enough and we can unpack what that all means. <laughs> yeah. So, man, I actually, we just spoke about it. I've known you for a very long time, man. We grew up in a similar sort of area, but for the people that don't know, tell us where Little Jace grew up, man. Uh, born and raised St Kilda. Um, and that surrounding area, Paran, Bala, um, uh, I did spend a little bit of time in Footscray. That's an interesting story how I we didn't got know there. That at all. Yeah, yeah, and um, we could get into that as well a bit later. But yeah, grew up there in the um, 90s, 2000s, rough. Uh, and you know, I'm definitely from the other side of the track. So you know, coming to bring that perspective of um, everything that a lot of us did go through, but hasn't really been represented to the fullest. So. Mm. It was a very interesting place to grow up and uh, as we all went to public schools, there was a lot of private school kids around and that sort of thing and it was a real mix of sort of, without saying poverty, but, you know, people that didn't have much and then a lot of wealthy kids as well, man. Yeah, the gap was big and I think that fed into my, uh, you know, anger of things, you know, why why don't we have what they have and... um. You know, there was, a, there was a lot more of them than there was of us. Yeah. So, you know, you're going at the time, you know, and I guess that's it, – it wasn't very safe for the private school kids because, you know, they're getting rolled for their yearly tickets, phones coming out, whatever. And, um, you know, that was just what it was back then. And, yeah, the gap was big. Mm. And, yeah, it, it, it's interesting that that ecosystem. Yeah, totally, man. Like just because it's a somewhat affluent area now doesn't mean that – the roots of that area, it's very blue collar and very working class. And that was like starting to just change around the 90s sort of thing. Yeah. And um, I mean, even just like St Kilda historically is a bad, bad, you know, place. I mean, it's red light. It's, but, you know, you go back into like back, back, back in the days, my dad's days, even further, mm-hmm. you know, it was gangster as. Yeah. And um, so those things are still, you know, Gatwick, obviously not being there anymore, but, you know, it was bad. Um, so... I think just being in that area and you go to a, you know, you don't have any, many options of like public schools when it goes to, like primary school is pretty much even for everybody. Nothing really too hectic happens in primary school, even though we were still doing hectic stuff in primary. But you, basically all the housing kids end up going to one or two schools in the area. And, you know, that's, that's going to um, cause trouble when we're all linking up and that's how I end up becoming a Paran boy and, you know, meeting my mates from Paran and I'm from St Kilda and, you know, that's just that connection and now you're going back to the flats and that's what you, that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, you're meeting everybody from, from, from those pockets. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it is interesting because you do, you're obviously from St Kilda but you do rep Paran pretty, pretty hard and that's yeah. something that you feel passionate about also, you know? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, St Kilda all day. 3182, but, you know, it's it's both for me, you know, um, and even, you know, Rock the Ballast stuff, um, obviously because I'm good mates with Hals as well and, and Tush, but that tri- that triangular uh, suburb of St Kilda, Paran, Bala, that's, I hold dear to my heart. A lot, there's a lot of history there. I, I went through a lot of things there, um, a lot of friends from that area. It was a good time. Like, it was, it was a dangerous time, but, like, it was a good time. But, you know, you still have those also, like, I'm going to Elwood Primary and I have, at the time, uh, I'm friends with kids who have, you know, they're affluent, Mm. but I don't know that, you know, and I'm not really aware of my situation and, you know, my dad rocking up looking like super gangster versus like someone normal when I'm not, you know, I'm looking back like thinking, man, what do these teachers think? Like, man, he'd like, I wonder if everything's okay at home and, you know, it wasn't, but, you know, you've got (laughs) affluent friends, you know, I've got someone like... uh, you know, Curtis Cummings, who is, you know, was like a good mate of mine, best mate of mine at the time. And it's like his dad made the jingle for Medibank, you know, I feel better now, you know. I feel better That's now. still going, isn't so it? So much better now. I'm like, what? Like, how much royalties does this, right? And then I'm going to their houses. They've got houses in Elwood, houses. and But you're not thinking about it like that. You're just like, yeah, I'm friends, you yeah. know. Um, but then it's like high school happens and they don't come to Elwood. They go to St. Michael's. They that go to happens Corfield. all the time, man. 
Like I remember it, I was at Middle Park Primary because my grandparents lived there. Yeah. Pretty much every kid goes to yeah Wesley, St Michael's, all that sort Caulfield of shit. Grandma. Yeah, Caulfield, yep. all that stuff. And there's probably like three of us that go to like Albert yeah. Park or Elwood. You know? Yep, yep. And I think that's a, it's actually a good thing because you get both. Like I, I like that I had though like both networks, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, your network is your net worth. So I feel like I feel as though um, you know that is an advantage, but. You know, there is a difference when you start going to like those, you know, public schools, especially with the housing. It's, lot, it's, it's really rough. It's really, it's, yeah, it's rough. And, you know, the, the education is a lot lower and, you know, statistically you're probably going to do bad. And, you know, the teachers aren't believing in you. They're like, man, you're just going to yeah. be nothing. And that doesn't help the problem. The whole thing's pretty fucked. Like from my school, I think we had like four year seven classes with like 30 kids in it. Mm. And I left by a year. They kicked me out in year eleven. But I think the, there what was did like you kicked out for. <laughs> they told me they told me I wasn't allowed to come back. They didn't kick me out. Right. I think you were a menace. I, yeah, I was just a shit kick. <laughs> yeah. I think I told the teacher. I, I tried to call the English teacher out for like just being a dumbass and all yeah. this sort of shit. And they're yeah. just like, don't come back anymore. Yeah. But anyway, the moral of the story is. <laughs> There was like, say, 120 year seven kids there, right? Yeah. At Hobson's Bay, which it was back in the day. And by the yeah. time that it finished, I think there was like 12 kids graduated. Shit. Right? So that shows yeah. you how many yeah. fucking kids come out of these public Absolutely, schools. Absolutely, bro. Like, because so, yeah. the, the thing was, if you didn't go to Hobbos, you went to Elwood. That was it. You only had if three If you didn't choices. go to Elwood, you went to Hobbos. <laughs> it was basically it. And if you got kicked out of one, you went to the other. That's what happened, you know? That's why I went to Sandy, because I'm like, well, I'm not going to Elwood. <laughs> That what's what's the next, next one, one over? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sandy. That, All right, that's okay that's there. good. That's it. But man, Sandy was great. Yeah, Sandy. Oh man, it was a good school, and so many people I've had on this show have been there because I think it does accept uh, creative people, and they'll. And, and the other thing is they'll fucking let anyone in, or they used yeah, to. Yeah, and it, like they'll also accept you if you can't be fucked doing anything. anything. Like I'm, I'm, I'm wagging class, and the teachers are walking past. I'm like, this is great. Okay. Probably not as great. Probably, they probably, yeah, now that I'm older, I'm like, probably should have encouraged me a bit more. <laughs> but it was like, I didn't want that at Elwood anymore yeah. either. Like, I was just getting in trouble for any and everything. It yeah. was like. So let's go back to the home life for a bit. You have mentioned that your, your dad was Scottish, your mum's Filipino. That's an interesting mixture. Yeah. And it's also, I guess, uh, something that you don't, you don't sort of see that often. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting home dynamic to start with. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, mum was from the Philippines. They met there. Dad came. He was on the Merchant Navy. Um, and my sister was born. I got a sister, older sister. She was born in um, in Manila. My mum's from uh, an island called Negros. Uh, and that's just kind of in the middle down south. Anyway, they come here and I was born here, 1985. And, um, you know, my dad was doing all right, you know, all rigging and um, construction, but was heavy, like Scott's, you know, alcoholic. I still remember those times, just like him just being absolutely blind drunk, mum grabbing us, running out the home, running down the street, hiding in bushes, hiding in trees, trying to find a neighbour that would let us in because he's gone ballistic. Never touched us, but it was just like... He had anger issues? Yeah, you know, um, and um, understandably, you know, because later on I kind of, he told us some things and I was like, okay. As I got older, I was like, well, you know, that maybe explains the substance abuse and the anger and, you know, the demons. And um, so, yeah, it was rough. It was rough, you know, like from early on, it was like, yeah. I mean, to put it short, my dad was a gangster. He was hanging it like the same crew, like, like that St. Kilda crew. Um, at the time, I didn't know who they were, you know what I mean? But now I know, you know, but Chopper's at our house, Mad Charlie's at the house. I don't know who they are. They're just my dad's mates, you know. Um, and but at the you learn that they they are underworld figures later in life. Later in life, somewhat I'm underworld like, oh, celebrities almost. Right, yeah. an important key players in this thing. And my dad's selling drugs. He's taking drugs at the time. My dad would always. I remember when I was at, um, you know, Elwood, uh, that flat. He'd always go into the room with like a glass and a spoon, glass and a spoon, glass and a spoon. And I was always just like. Why does he always take a glass and a spoon? Like, you know, I'm grade three, mm. you know, what's, what's that, five, six, like seven years old, you know? And, and he would always just do it and he'd always tell me like not to go, if, he, if I go in his room, don't look in his drawer, don't ever look in the drawer, don't ever look. And obviously one day I go look in the drawer, there's needles, this, that. And he knew I looked in it. I don't know how he knew. He's like, you looked in my fucking drawer, didn't you? I was like, no, 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 you know? Still didn't understand what this is, you know, but that's what's happening Spoon, people come over, spoon, water, walk into the room, close the door. 
And then he's always just sweating at all types of the night, season, winter. He's just, mm-hmm. you know, and as you know, you know, heroin addicts, that's what they're always just sweating. And, um, you know, that's what we had to deal with, stuff, stuff getting sold. I remember he sold my, um, he sold my yeah, um, Michael Jordan um, tape. Uh, what was that? Michael Jordan's playground. No, playground. Michael Jordan's playground. Yeah. It's my favourite one. I was like crying. I was like, where is it? Da, 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 da. And then like it showed up two days later and I was like, what? You know, and I, he told me later that he'd sold it and then got it back. But, you know, dealing with uh, that, you know, all types of heads, dealing with like violence, like, you know, mum and dad and like uncles, like, you know, Jonathan and Nico, Toes brothers, you know, they're like things are popping off and it's like all of a sudden you just see like the family start weaponing, you know, mum's grabbing a bat, dad's grabbing a this, they're running out the house because you know, someone's been attacked in wherever and in St Kilda, some sort of racist shit that's gone on or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's like just seeing that all, you know, and I was very observant. So I observed everything, you know. And I think it's only a matter of time before you figure out what the spoon and the glass of water is happening. You know That's right. I mean? And that, it is in St Kilda, man, there in the 90s. It was everywhere, Fitzroy Street, Grey Street. Everywhere. The needle exchange, that shit, there's syringes everywhere. Yeah. We couldn't go down the beach, man, because there's too nah. many syringes. And you, yeah, you get told that. And yeah. that's what, like, that area becomes known for. It's like, it's junkies, it's this, it's red light. But, you know, I've got junkies... You know, waking up and like going to play your Nintendo or something and like you walk into the lounge room and it's just people you don't know and they're just playing your games and you're like, what the fuck? Like, who are these cunts? Like, yeah. you know, prostitutes, all types of people in the house. But, you know, it's normal. You What's know? normalized for you? It's normal. You don't think it's not. Yeah, it's just normal until you grow up and you start seeing other walks of life, meeting other people and you're like, oh, okay, my life wasn't actually actually that normal it's actually yeah. probably the thing that was not that normal yeah but you can look at this in two different ways and i see people all the time you can look at that and go that's normal and this is a path i'm going to take or you can look at it the way that you have and said that's not normal yep. and i want a better life you know what i mean people ask me this all the time they're like everyone in my family was on drugs mom dad sister uncles cousins there wasn't there wasn't a sober person around me bro mm. you know and it's like, here I am in the middle of this chaos. And it's like, Jace, how come you never did it? I don't really have an answer for that besides God. That's part of my faith. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why. Yeah. I knew I was super ambitious, but I don't know what made me super ambitious and not my sister, you know, because we grew up under the same house. Mm-hmm. We're completely different in that sense. But I'm like, I would probably attest that to a bit of like Michael Jordan, maybe even, you know? just being inspired to be like, I want to be the next Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. Like maybe Michael Jordan saved my life, you know, God through Michael Jordan. Like it's like, I want to be, I was convinced that's what I'm going to be. And I saw the things, the drugs and what it was doing. And maybe, um, you know, that's obviously not going to get me there. Mm-hmm. And so I can't do that, you yep. know, so everyone else can do that. And I, I, the thing was, I was never tempted either, you know, I obviously had, you know, people around me that eventually fell into it. And, you know, that's what should happen. The stats are you should go down that route because yeah, you're a product of that environment. Big time, man. Yeah, the odds are definitely against you and you should definitely end up a junkie. You know, I had my next door neighbor in Elwood was, he's like my older brother. Like if I ever had an older brother, it was him. And he just happened to be like my first, not my first because like really Toes Brothers, which is, for everyone at home, like Filipinos, everyone's your cousin, everyone's your uncle. So especially when they live, next especially door. when they live next to, especially when they're from the same island as your mother. And so I looked at them as older brothers, and you know they were they were they were sick cunts in the area. You know Paran High stuff, which was before our time. Paran High was a hectic high school. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I wasn't, that wasn't my era. But it's like Paran High, Ardok, all of those things. But Nico and Jonathan were well known in the area. They were, you know, and so. I had, I grew up under that and my dad being super popular and being, you know, like I was just gr- like under that, um, you know, to, 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 on that trajectory of mm-hmm. like being good at everything and basketball and whatever. There was just sick kind of stuff. So Fernando was his name, which lived next door to us. And um, most people would know him as Turtle, but he was, um, you know, one of the founding members of 3174 gang. Uh, JFK, uh, that's how I got into the graffiti stuff, mm-hmm. you know, because these guys were from the Southeast, Dandy, like they were the first to be repping postcodes, 
Noble Park gang three one seven four was hectic. Like that was, you know, I remember them being all over the news and the pages, and he would tell me all the stories, all the war stories, all the graffiti story, everything, mm -hmm. you know. And that's how I learned about all graph, you know, all the gangs, everything, and that was influential on me. And that's like a big older brother. He ended up going to jail at like nineteen, and I was, I was grade three, grade four. He went. He he did two three years for um for an assault in the city. That led to him going to Pentridge and then sooner or later he ended up on heroin inside and then it was just a cycle from there mm. of like 15, 20 years of in and out, you know. And that's like an older brother who I still look up to today and, you know, that what effect does that have on, totally. on myself? Yeah, and it seems to be a cycle that happens with a lot of people. If you get locked up in your 19, it's pretty hard to get out of that cycle from an early age, man. Really hard, you know, and Fernando was one of those guys, Turtle, um, and shout out to Turtle, man, that's my older brother, like he, like, he was just a sick cunt, bro, like, he was the funniest cunt, good at everything, gun, gun at everything, and so that's just like, man, I won't be like this guy, you know, and he was literally my next door neighbor, and the way, the way we met was, he knew my, like, he was smoking weed, and he knew my dad was doing whatever he was doing, and so it was, like, one time he needed, I think he needed, like, papers or something, you know, or or whatever, and so he's, like, fuck it, he came and knocked on the door, he's, like, hey, like, do you have any, and he's, like, 18, my dad's, like, 40-something, and he's, like, yeah, you're like, you know, like, you got blunt, got weed, you know what I mean, so, and uh, my dad invited him, he was, like, yeah, come in, you know, fucking, and he looked at my, he looked at, I th like, I think, Fernando's weed at the time was like, oh yeah, not nah, have some of this, you know. And from there, you know, they like they became good man. That's how I met Fernando, and he became basically part of the family. He just lived right next door, and he was wilding at the time. And yeah, he ended up going through the system, and you know, um, and and still battling with that today, you know, just yeah. from there. But it's like, man, like I want, I aspired to really be like this guy who was like a sitcom from the area, and everyone knew him, and just you know, it's those are the things you kind of grow up and maybe not always the best idols, but it's like that that's what I had yeah. near, at, like in front of me at the time. Yeah. And you can, you have to be, a, you can't help but being a product of your environment, but you've got the positive role models that you're looking at. Like you've got Jordan and stuff. You want to try and not take drugs. You want to not be like that. So are you, are you d discovering hip hop about this time? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Like Jordan is someone that I can't like physically, t but everyone around me is like, th that's what, you know, in saying that it was like, there was no one there that was in terms of like doing the right thing. Mm. Everyone was doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, it, it's like, how do you break out of that? Right. Mm. You've got to go outside of that, but it's really tough when you don't know where to go. So, you know, Michael Jordan was probably a starting point. Fernando introduces me to, well, I'm listening because my sister would listen to a lot of R&B and hip hop. My sister was very popular as well. Um, and Fernando ends up really introducing me to like, my first, my first um, memories of hip hop was um, Rage and uh, like late 80s uh, MC Hammer. Um, Can't Touch This was like the first thing that I loved. Mm -hmm. Salt and Pepper, Push It. I remember those two playing. I used to go around with the tape of MC Hammer, like, can you play it, Dave? Can you play it wherever we go? So that was the first taste of hip hop. Um, Ninja Turtles, I think, was a very big thing because I love the Turtles. And then obviously New York and hip hop and the Turtles really. Um, that first Turtles movie was fucking sick, man. It's still, still king today, yeah. right? It's still the best. Um, that infused. And then you've got like the, the Turtle tapes. Like there was hip hop in the soundtrack. And then it was by the time, and Criss Cross was massive mm -hmm. for, for me and Toe, especially, and Mick. Were you wearing um, your clothes backwards? Yeah, man, we're doing it all. We plaited <laughs> yeah. our hair, everything, bro. Yeah. Like we plaited it. Like we had a crew. Like uh, me, me, Tom, and Mick. We had the. We had. Uh, it was called MTJ, Mick Toe Jason. <laughs> and um, I remember one time we kicked Toe out and we pulled Kian in. Remember Kian? Yeah. yeah. So and it was like we tried to. It was like JMK. We're like you know because Toe was being a bit of a bully to Mick. Uh, anyway, um, we ended up um doing all of that, bro. Like we was we was rapping from a very young age and writing, but it was just for fun. Because we, we were really into all of it, you know, all of, you know, house parties, um, NWH, Fear of a Black Hat, Minister Society, Boys in the Hood, all of that stuff we were like growing up under. You could still get them from the video shop, and like the yep, weekly, you That's know, you right, Video get, Flash or Blockbuster or CB4. CB4, all of that, we, yeah. we were right into it because that's what was really above us as well in terms of like the, the elders, Nico and 
Jonathan and they would rap as well, break dance. So the culture was really mm -hmm. in on us. But Fernando was the first one to like really put me onto like super gangster rap, Grave Diggers and um, Ghetto Boys. And um, Onyx was like a big thing for me, the, their album. Uh, like the all we got is us. Oh, that, oh yeah, right. 19, 1995 was a hectic year, right? And just like at that time, it was a really good time. And at that time, um, Toe and his family had moved to South Melbourne flat, Raglan Street flats. Mm -hmm. So and um, so we're also around South Melbourne flats as well. And they first got like satellite. Um, I forgot what it was. Galaxy. It was Galaxy, right? And now we're getting like 24 hour music channel yeah so now we're getting like method man and red man how high mm. like we're seeing like oh man so it's pumping at that time but yeah fernando introduced me to that he he would rap and he was the first one that um would really rapped like that i was like oh man not him actually it was webster webster and um and richie they had a group they had a group and um they even like rapped at the Pran town hall so i had seen my elders rap in an accent by the way right so it was like more americanized and fernando did the same thing and i remember him being on radio one time like he i don't know where he ended up at kiss or pbs or wherever but you know i was like man but i didn't think about it as like um a career i was always wanting to be a professional basketball player yeah. at that early elwood stage of elwood like primary grade three to like grade six but i think everyone was in that stage of like you know the mid to late 90s basketball was everywhere but um yeah, Saturday mornings, so, NBA action, action yeah. all of that stuff. Like it was, it was, it was great. Even NBL was M great, that, man. Man, NBL was good. Like imagine, remember going to like fucking Flinders Park? You'd see like Magic fucking yeah. Tigers. It'd be yeah. fifteen thousand people. The atmosphere was sick, man. It was sick. That's yeah. another conspiracy about what happened to the NBL. But we'll what, leave that. What, what happened? What happened? I don't know. Like, did you not realize that they just kind of like fell off the face but of that's the because earth? Because the popularity of basketball in general dropped off for a while. Towards, you know what I mean? My question is like. Why, you know? And I feel like it was like they wanted, NBA wanted to remove itself from like NBA and didn't want to be so like NBA-ish mm. where it's like, that's the reason why we're watching it. Like we're watching it because of DMAC. We're watching it because, yeah, yeah Gazy's killing it too. But yeah. like we wanted the razzle-dazzle. There was a lot of in, in, uh, intertwined. And I think after they kind of wanted to, like now you look at it, it's like they're doing it again. Yeah. It's like, NBL's going to play NBA. They're really infusing it. Yeah. You can go draft from NBL. It's like, that's what we want. Don't yeah. try and not be the NBA. Like, we want more NBA stuff, you know? I think they tried to expand in the wrong, not the wrong areas, but there was too many failed teams, right? Yeah. So they like the West Sydney one and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I mean, and Melbourne I think, Tigers is gone. That's oh, crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Man. I'd like to see a documentary on, on what happened because it was booming and then it wasn't. You know, mm, I've got a lost episode that I've never put out with someone pretty close to the Melbourne Tigers, very close to Melbourne Tigers. I'll tell you about it later. Yeah. Um, but uh, I haven't put that out for whatever reason. But yeah, the NBL is a fucking interesting story in itself. Do you know what I mean? I'm just glad that it's back and um, it's great. You know, but, but um, the stand. Oh, man, I watched the game the other day. The standard is fucking amazing. Amazing. It was and like Melbourne, uh, Sydney, Sydney end up fucking unbelievable. Winning, You're yeah. like, man, I want to watch this. Yeah. Like sick point guards, sick big guys, like. There's this guy right now, I think he plays for Tasmania. He's probably like our height. He's a gun, man. Yeah. He's a jet. And that's what I want to see. But yeah, exactly. I want to see these Alan Iverson type guys that are like taking it to the bigs yeah. as, as a small. Totally, man. And that's that brings me to another thing. You do, you are passionate about basketball and you've always been very driven, but you're not a very tall dude. I'm no. not very tall either. But that makes you actually – I think that potentially worked in your favor because that installed – a work ethic in you. Yeah. I know from a basketball point of view that you had to work harder when you're a little guy. Yeah, definitely basketball instilled that work ethic for sure. And the confidence, the belief, you know, because I came to Elwood, when I came to Elwood Primary, they had a good team, man. Like, you know, Kian, Mick, Toe, remember this kid named Paul Deline, Omed, like, I remember watching these guys and they were jets and like we'd go to the old Albert Park mm. and it was like they'd kick everyone's ass and it was like, man. And so they inspired me to want to be a better ball player, but I didn't really play ball up until then. I was playing cricket and, and footy. Like I was a gun at footy and cricket. So, you know, I, I started off a little bit late at the basketball stuff. Didn't know what a double dribble was, this, that. So, and Toe being like, you know, my brother um, and he's a jet. It's like, I had to just keep up with this guy. And he was obviously uh, a year above me and, you know, that really was iron sharpening iron. Didn't know it at the time, but I just became super competitive because I was like, you know, 
wanting to like beat him at everything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that that basketball thing from like grade three onwards and and playing with um the guys that I was growing up with and and learning the game and absolutely loved it and wanted to wanted to play professionally. Um, I never looked at it. Like it was delusional belief, which is what I think you need to have when it, when you're doing anything, mm. you know, work at it, but you still got to like, you got to believe to the max. So I was like, now nah, I'm going to play NBA. Now it's like, that's not enough. There are so many things that you need to do. Yep. And even if you are spectacular, you got to have the networks, you have the pathways. There's a lot, there's politics, mm. money um, to be able to build someone up to get them there. So it's not that easy, but you know, you're from the hood. You're from the bottom, underprivileged. Your parents don't know what to do to get you there. You're speaking to the schools like, well, how do I, you know, play professional basketball? They don't have the answers. You're like, you know, you're just being left out. But basketball was the first true love and that was the kind of North Star that kind of kept me going as, mm. as far as I could. And kept you away from drugs and booze, man, because from, from yes. what I can remember, you never touched that stuff much, you know? That's right. Um, I... Really didn't drink a lot uh, and, d yeah, just didn't do drugs, man. You know what I mean? Like I was just like, I, I, again, I wanted to be an NBA player and I just thought, you know, I had to be healthy. So, you know, I first probably had my I first drink at like 15, 16, but it was like here and there, you know. But um, from like that 15 to like 18 mark underage, it's another thing, right? That was really big. A lot of people didn't go to the underages, mm. right? But I'm playing ball thinking like I look back now and it's like I wanted to be a basketball player NBA that was my my career but I was really really starting to get hectic in the street stuff and not realizing that that could jeopardize what I wanted to do mm -hmm. until a bit later about 18 you know that I was like hang on a minute I'm gonna I'm, I'm, I'm training like I'm wanting to play professionally except then like I'm gangbanging on the weekends or something you know because like we've got beef with other cruise or whatever like this is gonna i'm gonna end up in jail or i'm gonna end up dead or something yeah. like it's not gonna be good and how am i gonna achieve my dreams then and then it finally kind of clicked that i should probably focus in more and stop getting into the shit that i was getting into you yeah. know so but yeah that 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 was keeping me driven but yeah i was still off to the side here you yeah. know so is there a specific moment that you can remember where you think all right if i keep doing this Basketball and basically a successful career and anything's going to be off the table because I'm going to end up fucking stabbing someone or something. Yeah, uh, there was. Um, it was probably, it was probably around the time that there was probably a couple of incidences, but I remember I, I um, ended up, um, I ended up getting into a beef with these guys from the west side, um, like around like Footscray, Braybrook. And it was like the first time this was like my beef. Like it wasn't someone else's. And um, they were Filipinos. And, and that's what made it even more. Uh, that made that enraged me even more. Because it's like I'm half Filipino. And a lot of the times it's like the full Filipinos might look at you and be like, you're half. Really? You're yeah, like there's that internal, okay. you know, especially I can't even speak Tagalog, which is you know the main mm. filipino dialect but you've always been so proud of your filipino i right? have so it's like you know i'm proud i'm proud but then they're like no nah, you're not really us you know and so that creates this like well you know well what do you mean yeah. you know but i am um my mom's filipino you know so i never looked at myself as anything but that i forget that i'm half scottish at times because i was i was so entrenched into the asian culture of um especially the gang scene and just everybody around me. But there wasn't many Filipinos in our area. It wasn't a lot. But the Asian kids hung out together. You That's formed right. that crew and that was... We had every Asian, Viets, yeah. Cambodians, Thai, Chinese, Philos. Like we had it all. So it was like that Southeast Asian connect is a thing. But there wasn't many Philos because they were more in the, um, the suburbs. But yeah, I ended up getting into a beef with them and we went back and forth for a bit. And I remember thinking that I was going to like murder these guys. Like I was, I was going to go that far because I was like in your teen years. Yeah, I was seventeen, going on eighteen, and you know, I was just like I had, a, I full had this elaborate plan that I was going to do it to like one up and 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 just you know, because I was like, man, these guys think it's a joke. These, you know, and you start. You start to one up, one up, one up, one up. And it's like, well, where does it stop? Mm -hmm. And as I was going down that plan of that thought, 
I was like, well, you know, well, when does it stop, Jace? You know, mm. and and this is obviously how it begins or gang wars really, you know, the blood and crypts are going on forever for 40 years yeah. because it's like, you killed my cousin, you killed my brother, you killed my this, you killed my that. And I was just started going down that line of logic and I was like, man, like, okay, but what about your dream of being a basketball player? It's like, if you go to jail over this and, you know, I start to have these talks with myself because mm -hmm. everyone's on board. Like, yeah, fuck these cunts. Yeah, right. Let's let's do it. You but know, no one else wants to be the weak guy. They everyone wants to say, yeah, yeah, we'll right, do it, we'll do it. right. Yeah. That's right. Because anyone who says, "Fuck, man, this is a bad idea," like, man, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, you're buckling. Mm. You know what I mean? So, I'm having these talks with myself, and it's like, like, where, where's this going? You know? So that's when I was like, you know what? Fuck it, man. Like, I, I got to pull the like, you got to choose. And so that was kind of like, I, I started to take a little bit of a step back. And my reputation took a hit in terms of, you know, because I'd spent so much time building a rep of like, yeah, Jace is not to be fucked with. He's a psycho. Don't Especially fuck with him. Especially when you're not a big dude, you got to go extra hard. Extra, extra hard, hard, right? Yeah. It's always the little guys that are like super skits and, you know, and, and that's kind of, uh, that's the only thing I really had mm. was like, that's it. That's what I got. Don't have money, don't have material stuff, but I got my respect mm -hmm. and people don't play with my name. So as that happened and I was taking, I was like, nah, I'm not going to, pursue this any further after a few tits and tats because i'm starting to think because i don't want to go tit for tat mm. like that's not what i want to do i'm like an all-in kind of guy like i'm either doing it or we're not mm -hmm. you know like we're either we're either gonna like be friends or we're not mm -hmm. like there's no middle so i was like well, i'm gonna go all the way but i'm like i'm not gonna do that and i don't, and I don't really want to be friends and i don't think it's gonna be a thing we're, we're all friends today you know so that's that's that beef has been squashed but you know that was a real time and yeah, I, I started to take a, a seat back and started to focus more on basketball and do that. And, and you know, I'm getting called a pussy for that. Oh, he doesn't want to roll. He doesn't want this and that and that. From within your crew or from yeah, the Yeah, yeah, from, from within the Paran, you know, mm -hmm. ecosystem. Not my closest people, but maybe some of the elders and just whispers and, you know, so it's like that's tough. Mm. That's tough. When Meanwhile, you're... a lot of those dudes are going to jail and prison and all that sort of stuff. So you see that as a reality and you're like, well, is it a pussy move? To not want to be there, you know? Well, yeah. But the thing is, it's like, as you know, it's like, it's looked at as like a stripe. Mm. Like it's, it's a kind of a, a rites of passage yeah, to yeah. go to jail and be like, yeah, you did it, yeah. you know, which is completely fucked. No, which is dumb as cycle. fuck. Yeah, because it's dumb as fuck. But it's like people wear that as a, yeah, yeah he's been in jail. What a mad cunt. It's like, mm. and I was like, that's not mad cunt shit. Mm. You know, yeah, you're a mad cunt if you can fuck it. If you've got fists, you can throw them. But like going to jail, I don't see how that trans translate into being a mad cunt mm. you know so i never wanted to get caught up in that but yeah you're like you start having that. and i had a i got a still brother to today you know shout out to mark daisy but you know he was a really he was the kind of cool calm head in the crew and he had those chats like jay's like why do you it would that was the first time i let go of people's opinions of me because that really i think dominates what people do mm. when you just care what other people think i had to just let go of that and that was the hardest thing for me to do because this was my identity yeah and now i'm not doing the thing that i'm known for which was taking action you know and doing something about it and now it's like yeah am i being a pussy am i not following through now like now i'm just gonna let these guys get away with whatever you know like i'm not gonna deal with this and like but why do i care what anyone thinks if i'm a pussy because he was like bro like they've never been in all the like They've never been in all the wars that you've been in. Hundreds. Bro, I've been in fucking hundreds of punch ons I can't even count them. Like, that's not normal. No. That's not normal. Like, when it's like, if you ask someone, like, how many punch ons have you been in? It's like, maybe a handful. I think it's hundreds, bro. Like, it's like, that's not normal. And it's like, when I started to audit that, it's like, yeah, like, you just weren't even around. And like, to be honest, if you just want to go one-on-one -on -one in a ring, I'll do that. That's what I'll do. But you can't question my manhood for not wanting to not go down a path that is going to fucking wreck me, mm. you know? So that's kind of hard to deal with at the time. And this is what I see the youngins going through now with a lot of the stabbings out of the gas. I know exactly what they're going through, mm. you know? But it's like if they don't do the thing, they get called out, their manhood's question for making reason of like, well, maybe I don't want to kill a cunt. Maybe I don't want to go to jail. Is that such a bad thing? Yeah. It ain't a bad thing, bro, mm. <laughs> you know? But I guess kids and like you were, you had... 
it's influence. You had stuff at home that you. So you go out of that, you go back to home. You're still surrounded by all this bad shit. That's right. And so where do you go? Where do I go? Mm. And so that was. I would always have issues with people who came from outside of that mm-hmm. to come just for, I guess, a good time or to be a sitcom. And when shit got real heavy, you can go back to your good home, mm. and it's great, and you can just hide there. It's like it's street in the street, and it's street at home. Mm. So there was nowhere to go. You know. So I mean, what do you do? Yeah, so what do you do? So I had to make that decision, you know. Later on, as we get into, you know, I don't know if we're going to have enough time, but, you know, there have was plenty a, of time, man. There's no yeah, there was, a, there was a time, um, you know, where it's like my dad was encouraging that. Like there was a moment later on where it was like, you know, it was – we were older now and it wasn't just like machetes and, you know, it was – now we're going to guns and shit and it's like my, 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 my old man is saying that you need to deal with this and take care of these guys. Which is such a conflict of interest, but obviously he's come from that criminal background, so he doesn't want his son to show signs of weakness. But if your own dad is telling you to do some bad shit, that's got to be conflicting. With yeah, the man. Mental, man. Yeah, because it's like, and my mum, Filipino mum, traditional, she's like, you know, Baba, don't do it. You know, don't do that. You know, and I'm like, you know, what the, what is that? Mm. Like you're supposed to be my father, but you're basically sending me into battle. But yet I do understand what you're saying in terms of respect and reputation. And you've, you know, you can't let these guys punk you or whatever. But at the same time, like if this goes off, I'm, I'm not even thinking about me. I'm thinking about the guys that are going to ride with me and, and be like, you know, what happens if one of these guys get shot or killed over my thing over 20 grand? Like, that's not worth it, man. No, no way. Like, the maths isn't... Like, no amount of money is worth it. No. I could just go make the 20 grand tomorrow. Like, what's the... Like, really, I'll just make it back. And really, I should, probably should have done a better job at this thing that happened, which we can go into a bit later. But it's like, what does that do to someone's mental? Mm. <laughs> you know, when your old man is like, yeah, you should go kill these cunts. Yeah. No, well, that's going to mess you up. You know? So, at the time... So, I think things like this has built my mental resilience Mm -hmm. of like understanding and the emotional intelligence has gone high to be like you know what all right dad you can think whatever but i understand what the right move to do here is and it's not that and i have to stand on that Mm. and back myself you know what i mean so whatever you think of me Mm. you know so and i and i think that first moment of um transitioning to be like look i need to focus more on my dreams otherwise i'm going to go to jail i'm going to hurt someone or i'm going to get really hurt or kill someone or i'm going to get killed that yeah, I needed to really pivot and that was a really tough time to, to hear those whispers and to hear that like because it's like, I oh, know I'm not that and you have to let go of that and you, you got to back yourself. Mm. You're like, man, these guys, whatever, they can think what they think and but a lot think- of people don't do well in that situation. They're just like, they get influenced and then you're really just doing it to prove them wrong and then you end up in a, in a, in a crash, mm. you know? So what do you do with this? You focus your attention on... Basketball. Music? Nah, Basketball's basketball at that time, time, yeah. So basketball. So, yeah, so this is what happened. So I, I focus. I go heavy on basketball. I'm at MSAC every day playing. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm not going to go. Because it was the Asian nightclub scene. Like, if you're going out, it, something's popping off. And um, yeah, so, Around that time, man, I think there was, like, salt. The dude got stabbed or jumped in yep, the water. That, all that sort of shit. All of that, yeah. you know. So, like, I know them boys, you know, the ones who did the, the chopping you know, um, and then a dude drowned because he was trying to get away. Yeah, over he, the yard. yeah, that's right. He was like, yeah. he wasn't going to get chopped. Jumps in and yeah. dies that way anyway. Yeah, you know, um, and the one of the first stabbings at the first stabbing at Salt was Toe's brother. He got stabbed. He was one of like so. It, we've had it close to home. Like yeah. he nearly died. Like it was like talking to a chick and blah blah blah. And then he just got stabbed. Liver, and he was the first one back in the day to get stabbed at Salt. Remember going to the hospital, he nearly died. We were like, you know, so seeing that all play out, yeah. seeing like revenge planning, this, that, you know, it's yeah. like you're a little kid. Like, is this normal? It's not normal. You know, something you're watching a movie, you yeah. know, which is normal. But it's like, no, nah, this is real life. This is what's happening. So you're seeing that stuff. And that turned him, you know, that really turned him. Like he became a real uh, violent drunk. You know, I used to go down with him and, to like Fitzroy Street when we were down at the um, housing in St Kilda. We'd go down and he'd just be like lifting up his top, like showing the marks, just like off his head, like, yeah, what? You know, like walking down, like just wanting to have a crack at everybody and people are like... You wouldn't Ooh. have to look too hard to find a fight down there. Yeah, like and it was like... And 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 I'm just like this grade six, like walking behind him. <laughs> me and Toe were like, what the hell? Like, you know, and, and nothing ever popped off. Like no one wanted to smoke with him, you know, but it was just like... 
if it did, like, God forbid, you know, we wouldn't, we can't do nothing with little kids at that time. But yeah. seeing the effects that that had and, you know, um, he's doing a lot better today, you know, works and all of those things. But, you know, hood trauma, hood stuff that just happens that's not regular, you know, you know, get stabbed every day and nearly die, you know. But, um, but yeah, so understanding those components and, yeah, so I end up focusing on basketball and um, I'm doing well and – Actually, uh, there was a, a moment where I left. So I was doing well, and then we got into a, we got into an altercation at Crown Casino, and um, this is what kind of changed the trajectory for me. Where I was like, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta move. But at the time, around that time, I really started getting heavy into the rapping as well, and I met a guy named Mel. We ended up uh, in 2005, ended up making like a, a rap group. And it was called Burn City Crew. At the time, I didn't know what Burn City meant. I know that there was Burn Crew back then. Um, I didn't know them then, but like, you know, again, the other side of the of the fence of, of hip hop in Australia. So we we created a crew, Burn City Crew. It was Mel, a.k.a. Mech, um, Kalini, a.k.a. Cali Castro, and Philly, a.k.a. Young Philly. And it was four of us, four Filipinos, mm-hmm. three from the west side, me from inner southeast. And he produced, and I really, really like, at that point was like, man, I might want to like rap, like rap, rap, you know? Um, But rewind a little bit. I had left and gone to the Philippines at 18 to play college basketball to like that. That's actually what happened Mm -hmm. now that I'm auditing it. Went there, went to university of the Philippines, UP Diliman. Went, was there for about three months. Just like literally walked in, was like, Hey, I can ball. Didn't know if that was the thing, but they let me stay and got my ass Hand it to me. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. got it. Hand it to me, man. Like, just like, it was a different level. Like, just like, man, like I thought I was okay, but man. So I ended up playing against the guy who ended up being like, he got, he got, um, tr- uh, what he drafted into the PBA, which is the Philippine Basketball Association. And at the time he was the best point guard in the entire country, you know? And we played a one-on-one, like one of the drills we had to do was um, guarding. And you had to get past him all the way to the end. I couldn't get past this guy, bro. Mm. So it's a bit of a wake up call to the to Yeah, the and we're and we're pretty fast. <laughs> like there's not anyone that could really stay in front of us, stay in front. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get past this guy. Like I was just like, what? Mm. And then he reversed it. He was just passing me at every like he was just toying with me at the, that stage. So I I knew I had a lot of work to go and uh end up coming back, tried out for like Altona Gators, VB. I was trying to get into VBL stuff. And I was doing really well at these tryouts, politics, hearing things later like, oh, you know, they're only going to go with the team that they had last season. It doesn't matter. Because I'm like, man, I'm killing these Is there guards. some racial shit that's happening though? Like, I don't know. Like, yeah, maybe. Bat, wrong side of the tracks. Yeah, but at the, yeah, maybe, you know. Um, I never really, I never, there was a bit of that. That could be some victimhood stuff, you know, but I know that I went and, did better mm-hmm. um but it could be like mm, you know defensive liability though yeah offensively he's killing it defensively he's pretty tough too but i mean he's five five and we could go with the six one guy who can kind of do what jace does and maybe jace is better than him like you know maybe there's those strategies yeah. I, um, that's reasonable and you're no, not no, having a growth spurt at this time <laughs> the growth spurt is done <laughs> you know so and that kind of was like i was trying to get in get in get in but then like from there i made a decision the hip hop stuff came. I started hanging out with the Burn City crew, and I was like, I kind of just looked at it as like, if I was, if I can be anything in the world, what would I be if it could just go like that? And um, it came up as a rapper. So I was like, man, I don't know if I want to play eighty two games or whatever the games were, and I'm gonna belt my body. I'm like, if, and I also want to make an impact and a difference, mm. you know, which is the reason why I still do that till today. And and do you do you do you? Idols change here. So Michael Jordan, the basketball thing, do you start looking at rappers and moguls and that sort of thing and thinking these are the guys that I really want to be like now? Yeah, because I'm like, how best can I make an impact? Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe it's through the art of rap and, you know, this thing that I do love so much but haven't really thought about a career. So I remember going to my dad and I, you know, because I was so committed to basketball and it was like, you know, it was like divorcing basketball and like getting a new wife. And uh, I told him, like, you know, I'm thinking about being a rapper and da-da-da-da-da. My dad was a poet. So, like, and he would write poetry to my mom and family. And so I think that's where I got the art of Ram. And yeah. st- we that, still got his poems. Like, he'd be on the ships, write poem. That's really interesting juxtaposition from somebody who was 
doing criminal shit and yeah. writing poetry. You know? Yeah, you know. Um, and so he, I told him and he said, yeah, sound, that's, I think you should do it. You should go for it. And I kind of just pivoted there and was like, you know what? I'm going to be a rapper. And Took that was that work ethic into the music. That's right. I, that's exactly what I did, which is funny because J. Cole playing ball talks about taking that basketball work ethic and applying it to rap. And that's what I did. And, you know, because I was a hard worker on the court and that's what I, yeah, I pulled that into rap and hip hop. And um, from there just, you know, worked on everything. And um, we made some mixtapes that obviously never saw the light of day. Um, you know, this is 2005. We don't have social media platforms like we do now. We don't like, I mean, what do you do? How do you get your music out? I mean, yeah. like we don't know at the time. No. We're just like, let's just make music, give it to our friends, burn CDs, whatever. It gets around here and there. Um, but as I'm doing that, there was, a, there was a time where, so going back to Rubes, like we were talking about. So I, there's a night, there's an Asian night at Billboard's I draw, um, yeah, so there's an Asian night at Billboards. I had a studio sesh, which was just at Castro's house in his room, um, in his cupboard. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to go make music because I'm like, you know, I want to do this. Uh, they're going to the Asian night tonight. So I go drop Ruben off in the city at Billboards and then I head to um, Werribee. And just for people that don't know, I, I knew Ruben. Ruben is a white dude but very entrenched in this Asian culture because he's boys with you guys. Correct. So just so other people get an underst- understanding of where we're at. Yeah. So he's um he's definitely the token white guy in the Asian group and he's our brother, you know. Uh, he really, really was our brother. So uh, I drop him off and Ruben's known in the Asian scene by, like now and, um, you know, he's known for being trouble. We're all known for being trouble. We've been kicked out of every... Is there other white dudes there? Is he pretty much like... He'd, he'd nah. stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, like every group had them. Right. You know, like our group had them, like West Side groups had them, whatever, Southeast token had them. Token white guy. Token white guy, that's what we call him. He's a token white guy. He's got Asian fever, whatever. But, you know, he just grew up with Asians and he's yeah. completely Asians. Um, every really group had like... And they were always... If they were there, they were lethal. Do you know what I mean? Like they weren't, they were there because they earned their respect. You know what I mean? Mm. And you, it's like, all right, you knew that this guy was, was tough. So Ruben was a tough guy. Uh, anyway, we, I dropped him there and he ended up um, meeting up with some, uh, some other of our boys, but only like two or three of them. So it was only like four of them. And what ended up happening was there was like a couple of weeks prior, Ruben had bashed some guy at Crown. Um, got into it with some guy. This guy was a somebody from Springy, and he it's didn't obviously know. a big Asian community there. Yeah, Springvale, the Viets there, and you know they weren't to be messed with. Um, you know, vice versa. At that point, like we weren't to be messed with. Vive. It was too, you know, that's the way we saw it. We didn't care where you were from. It wasn't one of those. We were like, yeah, you are from there. We're from here, and this is what we do. Mm-hmm. So, but it wasn't a he. Whatever, it popped off, and he ended up belting this dude, and. Um, from there, it was like they ended up getting into it that night. It was a full ambush kind of thing. So I didn't know it, but I hear it later. The story is, is that they end up getting surrounded. They're in the club. There's only like four of them. And they're looking around like, man, there's a lot of, lot of like guys around right now. It's probably like 30 guys. They end up, the guy, the main guy that Ruben had bashed come up to him. He's like, hey, man, you remember me? And he's like, oh, shit. He's like, yeah. So now they're like, wait, what? We all know that there was a punch on like two weeks ago, but we don't know who's what we went there. Ruben was with whoever he was with. They get surrounded and they're like, oh, shit. And um, the guy goes, yeah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, all right, you know, to make – and this is some Asian shit that happens, you know. All right, so he gives him a Jack Daniel bottle and he goes, take that. He's like, smash that on your on your head and we'll call it, we'll call it even. So what – that? hang on, explain that to me. It's like I got it over you. Okay. Oh, so this is like conceding defeat. You do that. Do I that win. and we'll let you go. Right, okay. You know, but you're going to embarrass yourself here. You're going to submit to me yeah, okay, yeah. and do this thing. Mm-hmm. Or – And that happens a bit, that sort of sort of like a power – Yeah, it's power – uh, you know, in the Asian community, it's like face. Yeah, you know, that's okay. like they they got to have face, saving face. And it's like, oh, you know, do you hear that? Yeah, they made him smash – they made him smash his head over the thing. And, yeah, okay. you know, like, fuck, you know, what a weak cunt. He did it, you yeah. know. Um, it's demoralizing in that sense. So he's 
he, so he's grabbed the bottle and he's told him to do it, you know? And um, he's kind of turned around to my mate. I won't say his name because he doesn't want to be known to be a psycho anymore. But he turns around and he's like, bro, and he's like, nah, fucking nah. And so, like, Ruben just turns around and he's just like, bang, just bottles the guy and it's on. It's du- he's doubled down now. He's doubled down. It's yeah. 30 on. But that's the way we were. Mm. We're not backing down. Four mm. on 30. Doesn't matter. It's going to go the way it's going to go. That was, the, that was how we were. And um, it went down, you know. And, and I don't know if you ever saw that, but there was a big scar on mm. Rube's face, you know. When he used to come back and play Swamp, I think, yeah. Yeah, so that scar was from that. Like mm. half of his head was hanging off. They ended up like stabbing him with bottles and da-da-da-da-da. Um, you know, but they done well for four of them. You know, they they handled themselves well. But, yeah, you know, that night I remember thinking like, man, I was just one decision away. I would have been there had I not gone to the, the sesh. Mm-hmm. So hip-hop at that point had saved my life of like, you know, I could have been stabbed that night. Yeah. But on the same have. side, Token, you feel somewhat guilty because you weren't there to help That's your brother right. out. That's right. I 100% yeah. felt guilty. I yeah. was like, man, I shouldn't have like, I should have gone. I should have this. I should have that. I should have that, you know, and it's like. But at the same time, it's like, man, that was, that was, a, that was, there was other moments like that where it's like, it should have, I should have been there or I was about to, something was about to happen, yeah. you know. Um, another story that was similar, again, an issue that we had, we were beefing with another crew from, um, it was actually Carlton. And um, we end up um, getting into it with them through Ruben. And there's just a lot of back and forth, tit for tat. And, um, you know, these boys weren't to be played with as well, you know. We we really banged with a lot of respectable crews, you know. It wasn't just like shit kickers. It's like we didn't want that. It's like if they had a name, we wanted that name too and it was like, you know, two top teams meeting each other. We didn't want to take on the wooden spooners. Like this is of <laughs> yeah. no – that's of no – that there's no uh, respect in that, you know. But if mm-hmm. it's like real – guys that you know they get busy it's like yeah we're not backing down from that you know because that's really the test of like you know how far you willing to go so we're we're going on with them but there was a, um and then there was like a truce and then there was like it went on again and what ended up happening was is that we went to the old this was like one of the last times qbh was still open because mm-hmm. mind you again we got kicked out of every club in melbourne really mm-hmm. we because we turned we turned up every club and now we're starting to get back in here and there. We're trying to like clean up the name because we're after the girls now and, you know, we want to go in We've the got club. got friends that are promoting. Them promoting and we're like, you know, we'll be good, we promise. So we end up going to QBH. No, we end up going to another Asian night and we got rejected. And we were like, oh, fuck it. But we saw, the, we saw those Carlton boys rock up. We're like, fuck it, probably better anyway, you know, because it would have just popped off. So we went QBH, but we didn't know. They end up getting barred too. So we're in QBH, unbeknownst to us, they go to QBH as well. So now we're both in QBH. Now, the way that we got down is from very early on was like no talking or action. We hated the talk. We, there was not going to be any like, oh, what, blah, blah, blah. It's just let's go. We, you, you, we, we're going to attack first. So we, we get told that they're here. We're like, what the hell? They're here. We can't exist in the same place. Like either one. They're either going to come at us first or... It's and getting, if you leave, it's a sign of weakness? That's right. right. It's like we're just going to allow to exist. We're not doing that, right? We have to attack these guys. So we – everyone's bottled. It's crazy when you talk about it like that though, isn't it? Like it's, yeah. It's bananas. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's insanity. Yeah. It's like why can't you just be at peace? It's like because they'll look at us as weak and we're not that and we're not going to allow this reputation of face and honour and respect and street stuff, you know, that most people just will let go, like whatever. It's like, nah, we're not doing that. So – we end up walking over and it was like even. It was like probably like six, seven on seven, right? They had they had their guys, we had our guys. It would have been a it would have been actually just a good brawl, fucking seven on seven. Um we get up and <laughs> I don't oh the guy threw the first punch. Uh, like we step up and Rube squares up and this guy ends up throwing one at Rubes. He he ducks him and I'm behind Rubes, but this guy throws it so heavily that he starts rolling into like he starts momentum. Stu- yeah, he's coming towards me. And so I've got my corona bottle, and he as he's coming, he's like, Oh, and I've just gone pop on his head, just popped him. Bang, he hits the deck. My automatic thought is I'm now just gonna start stabbing him in the face. Like mm. that's the automatic savagery. I'm gonna do that. 
as I'm about to, like, I've popped him, he drops. As I'm about to just go for it, it's just black. Just black. I'm just like, and it was like, I got teleported to, like, the wall. It was just like, shoo, shoo. I've got two or three guys on me, just bang, bang, bang. That's the blackness because I just went back. But they were in front of us, but we didn't know they had two tables behind us. Yeah, right. We, we just thought it was them. So, obviously, they've seen me pop one of their guys and I'm about to, and they've just rushed us from behind and it's like, bang, 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 bang. And I'm like, coming out of it, I get up against the wall and I'm like, it's just copping it, you know? So, now I'm just starting to do helicopters, swinging them off me, you know, and everyone's starting to go and I'm getting a few of the boys off me. Everyone's scattered now. It, you know, went from seven on seven to like, I don't know. There was, I don't know how many people they had, but they were outnumbered us at that point. Lost my gold chain. It was, it was all happening. So, um, Ruben ended up getting glassed. Some guy, one of the guys threw it like full cricket style, like from here to there and popped him right in the face. Um, and Toe hadn't come out for a long time. He was just obviously in his cave stuff, but he came out that night and he ended up getting stabbed in the head. And that's why Toe's got that scar too. So he ends up getting popped and I felt extremely bad because it was like, we've been going through all of these wars, all He's these taking back seat a bit, and yeah. yeah, and this is not really your wall. Like mm. you just you you even though toes toe can go and will go, but it's like, like man, like if anyone was supposed to be stabbed in the head, it should be me. Like not you. You've been on the bench, bro. You mm. know what I mean. And then you come into the game and you get got straight away. So yeah, that was I remember that. So he ended up. If you see toe, he's got a scar there. But yeah, he ended up getting got as well. And you know, I think we yeah we we lost that battle. Um, and you know, obviously security, da da da. Everyone gets split up, but yeah, things like that. Um, how do we get into that? <laughs> man, well, it's, it's, it's getting wild. Though, yeah, man. yeah. It's getting, but you're putting, you're taking this basketball mentality now to your street life stuff, yeah, basically. Yeah, and which is oh, so yeah, and the hip hop stuff. stuff. Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm obviously now rapping about the life that I lived, mm, which is normal to you. Yeah, which is what you do because that's what you know your your idols are rapping their lives, and that's why I'm connecting because they're from projects we're from housing we don't call it the projects but we understand that it's flats flats, flats and then yeah. they're talking about certain things in their lives drugs crime violence and i'm like yeah you know that's why i love mob deep that's why i love onyx that's why i love because i'm understanding mm. what they're saying mm. like i'm relating to that as opposed to like um hearing um you know like i said before bias b who i understand the graffiti side yeah. but i didn't really relate to anything else of the lifestyle that they were living you yeah. know so it's like i'm not connecting with that because i'm not their market i'm not their target audience no you know and everyone has the target audience but i was really gravitating towards like if i had someone that the only person who i really ever connected in the aussie aussie like the the hip-hop was like the first person that i was like man this guy's sick was um trem Mm-hmm. Yeah, Trem he's was still making music now, right? Yeah. And that's because he's talking that crime talk, mm-hmm. heavy jailed like street talk. So I understand that, and I was like, man, nah, this guy's dope. But that was like, bro, I didn't come across Trem until like I don't know, ten years ago or something. You know what I mean? Like I was already, yeah, I'm twenty years into my rap career, so that was like ten years in. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this guy's super dope. Like Trem's sick. You know, I would. That's someone who I mess with. You know, I'm particular yeah. with my music. But it was, for lack of a better term, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, it was very like Aussie hip hop that was popular was very white, for lack of a better. It was skip hop. Like yeah, I mean, that's an actual hip-hop. term. It was, yeah. Like, you can look that up. It's like skip hop. And yeah. so that's the other reason why I kind of rejected it because I'm like, nah, I'm not skip. I'm Asian, and mm. there's other things that we do here. You know. Also, and in the Filipino version of english it kind of it's has american a bit of a, a very american my very mom american. sounds american it's very american we're very americanized you know we were we, we were uh, american tv and right how to speak after like spain comes it's you know it's japan it's america yeah right it's everything is america there like you go there every it's like 90 percent english everyone speaks english pretty much and but with an american accent with an american accent yeah. right 100 percent. and so um that being said that being said like because some people have said, like, oh, did you rap in an accent because of the Filipino thing? It's like, nah, that really had nothing to do with it. It just was the way that um, – uh, the easiest way is, like, you know, you sing a song the way it is and you sing karaoke, you sing the way the song goes. I would I would rap – I could rap lyrics, like recite albums, like Jay-Z's Reasonable Doubt, I can rap top to bottom. Um, I'm not rapping that in my natural accent. I'm rapping it the way it sounds. And OG Phil, shout out to OG Phil. He's like, nah, you're not, you don't have an accent. You just sound hip hop. 
And that's how I looked at it. Like, yeah, I'm just sounding hip hop. What's what, what's hip hop? Well, the music that we listen to from America, the, yeah. the culture that created it. When I wrote it, I would then recite it in an accent. I didn't know that that was an issue until they made it an issue. And mm. it's like, and then now because you're making it an issue, I'm also then going, well, you know what? Fuck yous. Mm. Like, I don't want nothing to do with that side. So I'm doubling down now. Mm. You know, whereas like now I rap in my normal accent. And yeah. there's a reason why I do that now. But, you know, that's a whole different thing. That's a whole different uh, discussion that they don't see. It's just like they're being try hard Americans. It's like, it's not that simple. Mm. But all the, all the, like, I've never been to an Asian night. I've been to all these nightclubs you speak of. Never? Man. Never been to an Asian yeah. night. I've been to, you know, Billboard and Seven and all those joints, like, for sure. But probably on they the They had board. bad brandings, but people were like, I'm not going to an Asian night, bro. I'll get stabbed. Like, it was just like the joke, you know? Yeah. Not that you would, but there was a lot of that. It was a lot of that. But I'm, but I'm guessing it, it's very hip hop. Like, it's, you hundred percent. You're not, there's no, there's no fucking house hip-hop. music. It's just nah. hip hop straight hip-hop. up. So you're hearing that you've been influenced from that. And then when you're doing the, sh- like, the little gigs there, that's what they want to hear as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's very gangster rap and, it, and, the, and the Asian scene was very that. Mm. So, especially in the 90s and 2000s. So, I'm rapping, I'm living my life and I'm rapping the life I'm living. And, you know, if you ever hear all the old school music, it's all violent, it's all hard, it's all super gangster. And, you know, that's the way I was living because I didn't know. I was, I'm a life rapper. I'll rap my life and I was just telling my stories. And, you know, uh, I focused on that and I was getting into still, you know, like, because again, as you start to realize like, man, no matter how long I kind of stay out the game for, it's like, it's going to, like if I'm hanging around Rubes and he gets into something and I could have not gone into trouble for like a year or two, but now like I go out with him and now it's on and now I'm into a punch on and now it's like, uh, you know, like again. So it's just like I, I started to realize like I need to like be more careful who I hang around. Yeah, you know? which is tough when you've got all that shit happening on your doorstep and at home, you know. Yeah, and because I'm loyal like that, like if if you know if if you were in St Kilda and I saw you getting into an altercation, like me and you hardly see each other. Yeah, you know, but we're mates. Yeah. But if I was walking down the street and I saw you get jumped, I'm not walking by, bro. Like I'm yeah, getting sure. in, like I'm punching on with you. Like you're gonna be like, Jace, where'd you come from? Like that's <laughs> the kind of person I am. Yeah, man. I can't sit even if I don't know you, bro. I'm mm. that. That's I've, the the amount of times I've like stepped in. For people that I felt were outnumbered, like that I don't even know, mm. like I've done that like several. I remember I was one of the last times I was at um, I was at Elsie uh, Mackers and I forgot who I was there with. But after midnight, man, that'd be there. That, that and St Kilda Mackers would be just fucking. Yeah. It's it's yeah. So I was at Elsie Mackers and there, there was this kid like in front of me with a chick and and he was getting bullied by like these other guys at the back, and there was like six of them and I think they kind of like knew him and. Like he was a bit of a geek and they were trying to be like, oh, you know, and like, and she was just like, don't worry about it. It was like a scene out of a movie. She was like, don't worry, it's okay. And he, and he, he wasn't going to defend himself, mm. you know, but I was sitting there. I'm like, and I've always been like this. Anybody that grew up with me or knows me, I was always good with the, you know, the geeks. Like I was, all, I, I would, I didn't like bullies. Mm. So like I would come to the school and I was the bully bully. So like the first time I got to Elwood, Sean Lewis was, um, one of the guys that was like the bullies at the school and like he came up to me, tried to bully me on the first day and I just dropped him, you know? And it was just like bang and everyone was like, the clouds just disappeared and everyone was like, oh yeah, Jace, thank you. And I was like, you know, that's how you deal with it. Mm. So, and we ended up becoming best mates like from there, you know? But I would always have to like stop Sean from bullying someone and be like, brother, leave him alone. Mm. That's how I was, you know? I don't like that. So I stepped in for this guy, Elsie Mack, is like I just turned around and I put it on him, you know? I was like, what well, he's going to, you know, I'd, I won't say what I said, but they were just like, oh, crap. And I'm like, yeah, you say it to me, you know? And they were like, oh, no, nah, man, we don't, you know? And after that, they they buckled and they, they went their own way. And the guy was like, thanks, man, I appreciate it. The girl was like, thank you. I'm like, no, nah, it's all good. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I don't appreciate people like that. No, you know? and, you want, and you, yeah, you want, to, you want to do the right thing because at the end of the day, you, I, I believe that you have – High morals, you know what I mean? That's what it is. Yeah, I can't sit there and see the injustice, you know. And I'm also not – the other thing is is that because I have a lot of experience in terms of, like, violence, it's like I'm not – I'm willing to go there, bro. You just want to go there, we can go there. I'm very comfortable there. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could just keep this as a verbal, you know, but if you think that I'm not going to cross the line, you're, you're really mistaken. Yeah. You know, and I think that also was also hard at basketball because you're at Swamp and people are like – 
you know, getting like mouthy and it's like, hang on a minute, bro. Like I'm about to not to make that. this basketball, yeah. you know, I'm about to like fuck you up for real and be barred from this whole thing. I'm about to like go to the car and get a pole and belt yard. Like those are the things that you have to like, cause it's like, no, it's basketball. Like don't do that thing. That happened there more than once. More than once, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Cause there are, they're boys from the hood playing ball basketball. and it's respect and it's like. It'd be funny. Like sometimes you're like, oh, I didn't know that guy got out of jail. And yeah. that's the first time you'd see him would be playing basketball. Yeah, right. I just mouthed off at a guy that just got out of jail. Oh, like, yeah, it. and it's funny as, yeah, cause it's just like, you know, but Swamp was, was great, but. But yeah, you know, things like that. And um, I knew that I had violent tendencies. I knew that that was a thing that I enjoyed. I really should have boxed. I should have done something like that. I wish I had yeah. like even like pushed it. pushed it there. But it's probably a good thing you didn't drink and stuff, man, because you've got this violent, you know, way you can snap. And if you did be intoxicated, who knows where Brother, you the, Well, the thing was is that the reason why I didn't drink was because I liked fighting. Yeah. And I realized that, well, if I'm drunk, I'm not going to be at my, 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 my A game. Yeah. So I'm like, nah, everyone's drinking. I want to be on point because when it goes down, I want to be ready. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know who does that, but that's what I did. Yeah. Like, the reason why I didn't drink was, a, especially going to the parties, was because, nah, you know, like, I want to be ready for the rumble. And not to not to put you in the shit, but you guys were looking for fights some of the time. A lot of the time. A lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, oh, bro, we used to, like, I remember, like, getting on the tram and going to a party and being like, man, I can't wait. Like, I hope we get into a punch on the night. Mm. The thing was, it's like, I would never start anything. But I would always, I would never start anything, but I was always happy to finish it. But then I look back and it would be like gaslight someone or like pretend to be like if there was a guy that I knew thought he was a sick cunt, I would kind of bait him into like, you know. Being the aggressor. Yeah, like bait him into like saying something slick because he thought that I wasn't really about that, mm -hmm. you know, and then turn on him. Yeah. You know, to be like, it's like, you know that, um you know, is it Goodfellas? And uh, Joe Pesci's like, oh, you think I'm funny? And he's like, yeah, it was funny. He's like, nah, tell me how you think I'm funny. What, you think I'm a clown? And it starts to get real serious in this like, nah, like, bro, like, what do you mean? I just thought you said a joke. He's like, nah, yeah. tell me. You think I'm you think I'm a clown? Like, start turning it on and they're like, nah, bro, like, what? Like, I, I would see that a lot from other people as well. It was a tactic, you know? So I would do that. Like, oh, hi, everyone's funny. Oh, it's funny. Yeah, is it funny? You know, it's just like it, you, you change the mood, everything starts happening and it's like, so I was looking for it for sure 100% yeah. of the time. But but as an intelligent person, you've got to get to a stage where you think, well, this is bad and it's not going anywhere, just going for this, looking for trouble, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But at the same time, music's not going to pay your bills, so you still got to be doing yeah. some sort of underhand Hun shit. 100%. So even going back to like, you know, what made me pivot, when I told you before when I was 15, 2001 New Year's Eve and we had the we had that fight at Sal Yards and um you know we ended up getting arrested for that and it was the charges were attempted murder so I'm 15 looking at attempted murder charges that didn't stop us like what did your dad say that with that what was he like man? bro like no when when I got raided in the morning so what happened was is that we're graffiti like we we're, we're heavy in the streets right so we're like this it's 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 Paran boys it's Asian gang. It's Asian pride, right? That Asian pride song that came out, yeah, got, yeah, rice, yeah, got, got rice, got rice, bitch, bitch. got yeah, rice. That, yeah. that set the Asian shit on fire, bro. Like mm. that was like, you know, you listen to that. It's like, we lived that. It's no one-on-one. -on -one, it's three-on-one, -on -one, no doors, you know? Like, um, so that set us a lie. And we're also graffitiing. Well, not everybody, right? But me and Toa heavy into that. Like we start TKO. So, so I know Baylor was on here, but you know, we started TKO, me and Toe, and Matt O'Rourke. So, you know, we went through numerous crews to eventually get to TKO. Mm -hmm. And we go repping that. The original members of TKO is um, myself, Toe, Matt, Jesse, and Reynolds, right? And then, and then you got the, like, the second draft. And the reason why Baylor came in to TKO was through Reynolds. And I had a bit of issues with Baylor, like, th with that book that came out and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But we sorted our differences um, but you know, so we're, we're, we're representing TKO. And, and the other thing is, is that with any graph crew, a lot of it is in two parts. There's the writers that are really writers, really, really writers, you know what I mean? And then there's the guys that are like putting in the work for the name in terms of like street stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, man, that crew's not to be fucked with. Cause no one ever looked at a tag and a piece and was like, Hey man, that guy's hectic. Don't fuck with him. 
because of his art. That's not how it went. Mm. It was like, nah, bro, certain people that if you heard their name, you're like, nah, bro, he's a fucking psycho. Not because, and he can paint, you know? So I wanted that, you know, I was decent. I was pretty good. I ended up getting good with my graph, but like I really wanted the name of like more so like, yeah, Jay Scraps, but he's more of a brawler. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were, we were representing that side of TK a lot of it, you know, but we were busy like graphing and stuff like that. And so the reason why I was saying that is because when I got raided, I thought I was getting raided for graph. Yeah, right. right? That's what I thought was getting, you know, I woke up at 6 a.m. and I look up and my mum is at my bed trying to like stop them and she's just shouting, don't fucking touch my son, don't fucking touch my son. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, why are you guys having this argument in my room? Can't you just go out? Like, who are you? Like, I'm not jaring that. It's fucking city CIB at the time. That's what they were called, CIBs. And um, they're like, hey, so you know why we're here? I'm like, oh, no. You know, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, like, is it graffiti in my head? I'm like, they're like, no, New Year's Eve. This was like two, three months later. So I'm like, what the fuck? That was like three months ago. It was all over the news, etc. Guy was in a coma for three days, ends up getting a metal plate in his head. He survives. They were like, this guy's on life support type of thing. And I'm like praying to God at the time, like, please don't die. Mm. It wasn't that serious, you know. It's just he started it, we finished it. They were older as well and, you know, we weren't going to back down from that. So I think it's – I actually think that it's graph, but it's not. And then I'm like, oh, shit, man. Um, and the crazy part about that story was is that they wanted to grab my clothes from that night. And they were like, we need your clothes from that night. I'm like, it's three months ago. So I'm playing down. I'm like, I don't know what I was wearing that night. Like, I can't remember. And they were like, will this rejog your memory? And they pulled out a picture of me of that night. Yeah, right. And I'm thinking, fuck. But I had no top on. Like CCTV or something? Nah, they, I remember they took photos of us because a, a van rocked up oh. of like jacks, After, 30 yeah. jacks. And they were like, hey, you. you and I'll tell that story in a sec. But they ended up, um, they, they ended up taking pics of us. And they've got that peak and I've just got no top on and my jeans and they're like, we need the jeans and the shoes. So I'm like, oh shit. And I'm, so I go into the cupboard and I'm like, and I'm looking and I'm like, I see the jeans, but I'm just like, uh, yeah. And the, the detective's like, those look like it. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Give it to him. But it's like five pairs down. And he's like, and what about the shoes? And I'm like, ah. Uh, so they've got a search warrant to get all this. Yeah, yeah. They've got a search warrant and everything. And then it's like, Where's the shoes? And I'd thrown them out, right? Luckily. Luckily. And, but I'd kept the, you know, you used to keep your, your shoes fat. I kept put the tongues in from the, those old ones. <laughs> so, and they were like, those look like them. And they weren't. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's them. So I just went with it. Mm. You know, I wasn't like, that's not them. I was like, yeah, that's them. You're right. But then I remember, I'm like, fuck, the tongues in them. I'm like, are they going to look at that? Like, are they going to test that for blood or whatever? Anyway, long story short, that ended up getting I, – I, and they took me. They were going to remand me in children. They, came, they took me to child's court and they were going to remand me. And um, again, man, I dodged the bullet. Like they called the detectives up to the stand because I didn't know what was going on. Like I was like I, – I, they brought me in for questioning. I already knew – oh, going back to my dad because you asked me what he said. I already knew what to say. Like I was prepped early schooled on. You, yeah. I was schooled on, no comment, you know, from the get-go. So, and this wasn't my first interview. I'd, I had been pinched for graffiti before, but again, no comment. They had nothing on me. We just had flicks. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, you know, it's like, it's not illegal to have flicks. Mm -hmm. Are they yours or you just taking flicks because you like them? So no comment, got out of that one. Uh, now this is happening. I get to the station. My mom's trying to talk to me in Filipino, Tagalog. I don't understand what she's saying, um, And but it's no comment. Then they take me to the kids' court. They try to remind me, but... The judge calls them up. He has a little bit of an issue with them and da-da-da. And he's like, Mr. Ken, you're free to go. Sorry for wasting your time. I was like, okay. But I didn't actually know that that's what they were trying to do. I thought they were – like I didn't know they were trying to remind me. So we – apparently they didn't tick something on the warrant and it was a technicality and it's like, yep, you're out. So I didn't get reminded that day. But when they when they came, the Jack the, – the like two detectives knew my dad. Yeah, okay. They're like, oh, Jock, how are you? Because that was his name in the streets, Jock. Uh, yeah, how's, how's, how's Charlie? How's, not Charlie, Charlie was, was Charlie dead at that time? That's another story, mad Charlie, bro. Um, so, um, you know, sad what happened to Charlie. He ended up getting shot in um, Caulfield, mm -hmm. like North Caulfield or whatever, just Bamber Road or whatever, out the front of his house, like seven to the head. You know, and that was part of that whole back and forth. That was like the beginning. beginning yeah. It was like Alphonse, 
then it was Mad Charlie, and then it was like boom, 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 boom. He was like the second or third. And I remember coming home from school that day and my dad was crying and the news was on and I was like, what's happened, you know? And it was like, Mad Charlie had died and I was like, oh shit, you know? My dad helped him like set up the CCT uh, TV around his house at that time, but it wasn't on. You know, chop blah, blah, blah. They're having their, they're having their uh, old knockabout talks. And then, you know, the guy, the, the Jack's like, oh, you know, like father, like son, and he's like, nah, fuck off, idiot, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, that's how... Uh, involved it was you know what I mean the yeah. Jacks that raided me had raided my dad like before yeah. um, in, in Hotham Street because we used to live in Hotham Street and um, I remember going to court and that's why I got we got kicked out of St Kilda my yeah. dad got raided kicked out of St Kilda we went to Footscray and we had to stay there for like 6 to 12 months and um, yeah my dad actually got off that case and then we ended up coming back to St Kilda and I got to Elwood yeah, yeah. that's where I was in that flat but before that flat we were in, we were in Footscray the heart of Footscray but um, yeah, so um, we end up at uh, we end up at what was I saying with my dad? Um, yeah, that that was the story about like what do they think about that whole situation? But there's these moments that could have just threw me off course, and they just again, you know, that's that's part of why my faith is strong um, because I just feel like there was no way to really explain it besides God because I should have. Like people, people went down for less. Yeah, but but and just to just to wrap that story up, that guy lived. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, lived. so that guy lived because you were. This touches on your faith because you said you were praying that the guy lived because it was. Some but strange. you know, again, what's funny about that is is exactly what I see today. Is like I didn't really truly believe in God at that point, but right. when shit hits the fan, you believe. You turn, yeah, yeah, yeah. When that plane starts to nosedive, you, you're praying. Right, like it's just an innate thing. So I'm praying, man, because I'm like, I don't want this guy to die. Like Over he's a shitty skate park incident. Yeah, that. It, yeah, you know what I mean. Like that, he wasn't even involved. He was just a drunk dude that was being a hero, and he got his ass handed to him. You know, so. But that didn't mean we wanted to kill him. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah, man, like I saw his dad crying on the news and everything. I felt bad, you know, but is what it is. And um, and obviously there's a story behind that which I won't go into of what happened, but. Anyway, that ended up getting dropped. We we didn't we didn't go down for that. And Pretty heavy to get fucking attempted murder charge at fifteen, man. At fifteen, you know, and what does that do for the notoriety? All right, the oh man, the, the boys are hectic. You know, they end up getting raided again. You're earning stripes, mm. you know, and so that's what's happening. Builds the rep. Builds the rep. So I'm building this rep. 15, 16, 17, 18, underages punching on this, that, making a name, going to other house parties, punching, you know, meeting with other crews and doing all this stuff that was really like just had no bearing on anything that is important today, mm. you know, but at the time it's like, like if I could rewind it, I wouldn't change anything, but I understand that it was like, I didn't need to do all it. Like none of that pays my bills. Yeah. I get respect from some street dudes in the street, but like big deal. Like that doesn't, mm. what does that do besides stroke my ego? Yeah. You know what I mean? But like you do have to make money at some point. Yeah. So I, um, well early on I was, I started, I started dealing at 15. Right, because that's what mum's doing, mum and dad's doing, the uncles are doing, cousins are doing, everyone's doing it. So I never took drugs, but I saw the money in it. I'm seeing bags of money, I'm seeing this, and, and you know. You're thinking if dad doesn't take it, we could be making bulk cash here. You know yeah, I mean? that's right. Like, you know, he's getting high off his own supply, and you're listening to rap, you know, they're schooling you on these things, and I'm like, okay, cool. You know, it's blueprints coming out, like Jay Z's giving you game, and I'm like, oh, okay. You know, I want to be the Jay Z of Australia type of thing. But from 15 on was because I remember getting my first job at Burger King in on Fitzroy Street, which is which then became Cushion Lounge. That's right. And it was the post office before that. Before that, <laughs> yeah. right? So that Burger King, I went and I remember I was like, all right, I'm going to work. And I worked like six, seven days and I went to the ATM that was next to it and I got like 80, 90 bucks and I was devastated, bro. I was like, I worked all that time and I only got that. Like, I don't know. I, like that, that, I think it, if I'd gotten like four or 500 bucks, I would have been like mad. Mm. That moment kind of was like, stuff this, man. Mm. I'm yeah. not working my ass off to just get this 80, 90 bucks man, when I know. stereotypical hip hop. I worked in a burger place. Right. And then realized this isn't this for is me. A, this <laughs> isn't it. So I'm like, if that, I don't know if they botched my pay or something, but like, <laughs> bro, like that really turned me off of like work. The other thing is I didn't have the, because by the time I'm in housing in St. Kilda, 
my mum had been injured at work. She's working 12 hours. She's six, seven days a week to try and, you know, she's bringing in the bread. My dad's not. It's right. A yeah, and and he's at this point he's actually just gone cold turkey. He moved to. He's trying to get. He got clean mm-hmm. off heroin. Um, eventually when we moved there, ninety six, ninety seven. She ends up working herself into the ground. So now both of my parents are on disability pensions, and I don't. I realize this. I'm like, oh, if you had parents that like worked and that's what you saw, and that was normal, and they showed you that kind of work ethic, that you don't have an issue with working because that's normal. Mm. That wasn't my, like, my dad's just sitting around, smoking weed, drinking beer. Mum's just at home because she can't work. I'm this not, becomes systemic though, man, with a lot of people. This becomes systemic, right? The, you're in housing. You're in, if you're in housing, it's because it just is what it is. It's, it's it, you know, people can agree or disagree, but your parents didn't do what they were supposed to do, right? And whether or not they copped a bad hand and they were dealing with things, it just is what it is. Like mm. the parents were supposed to set you up. And a lot of my anger came from that. Like why are we in housing? Why aren't we like them and they've got a house? Whatever. Mm. Now I know mum's dealing with dad. Dad's dealing with demons. He's in the streets. Like we're going nowhere fast. And that's why we're here. And a lot of the families are, that's why they're there. It's drugs. It's mental health. You know, in terms of like they don't know a way out. They're struggling with how to see or even plan or what to do. It's just drugs is numbing them and they're just on the Dole or Centrelink and they're just there mm. in this cycle of just, uh, this is all, all it's going to be. This yeah. is all it's going to be. And um, I'm like, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use I'm gonna use this to make money so I can get myself into a bit of better position. I would work here and there to supplement. And be like, you know, like a lot of dealers would be like, you should work, you should like the smart way is to work and do both so that you have two streams of income and any personal development book will tell you that you should have multiple streams. So I was like, yeah, true. So I was really like just using the knowledge from the streets and then I started reading books. My first, my first book that changed my life, really personal development is what education changes situations if you apply it. And that's what I did. First book I read was, Rich Dad, Poor Dad Mm -hmm. by Robert Kiyosaki. And that opened my mind up to, oh, okay, there's a different way to do things. This is the rich mindset. This is the poor mindset. I understand the poor mindset because that's where I come from. Now I'm going to grow the the rich mindset. So I was doing that all the way up until like from 15 all the way up to like 27, man, you know, Um, and it just grew and grew and got into heavier stuff. And because work ethic and I want to be the best at things and I don't just want to be someone that's just selling an ounce and that's it and I'm good and I have my seven grams to smoke and nah, I'm like, oh, I could build this like a business, you know? So that's where it starts to go and I start to make, see more money, do well. Um, but, you know, it was, it, it was just a means to an end because really what I wanted to do was rap, but rap's not paying the bills. No. You're dealing with a country and a market that is so small. Now I understand that, Mm -hmm. you know, they like, there's not enough numbers, man. Mm. It's like trying to sell coffee to people that don't drink coffee. You're not going to do very well. Mm. You might convince someone to maybe take it, but. Is there a market in the Filipino culture though? Like over there? For like. For music though. Well, at the time. So when I left, so what ended up happening was I leave, I go to the fields because I'm, I play basketball. I come back, I double down on hip hop because of uh, rap because of the Burn City crew and then I get into a a situation at Crown Casino going back to that and one of my mates Sanchez he ends up getting bashed by the um, Crown security guards and they were they were ruthless back then Crown security was not to be fucked with and they were just dirty and unfair there's heaps of them man as well they just come out of the woodwork and there's all these little back passengers all of that right you end up in there you're fucked you know then you get kicked out of some side door but I mean there was stories like Ruben had been like dragged into the back once and like they just held him down and like just with his head up and everyone just like took a goal just taking soccer kicks at him girls guys just like bang next bang next bang next and so you grow a disdain for these guys and you're like man that's unfair like all right you can rough us up but like these are like dirty tactics and I hate you guys you know so I ended up getting in but I ended up trying to solve I knew both groups and they were in, in the old crown with the old food court with Galactic Circus down the bottom. You could just go down the middle. I ended up like um, 
doing some diplomacy between two groups because I know I'm not chill, da, 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 da. The security guards came and they started like grouping us all together. I'm like, nah, man, I'm trying to help you. Like I was trying to do something right. Mm. They end up like kicking us out. I'm like, man, cool. All right, we get out. Um, Sanchez, the idiot, ends up like just provoking him. He shouldn't have, but he went up and did one of these like under his hand, like, you know, da, da, da. They end up grabbing him, dragging him in. Well, they can't take any chances. They can't, right? So I'm like, you're a dickhead. You shouldn't have done that. Right. He ends up getting let out after. He's just like black eyed this, that. I was absolutely drunk at that time, mm-hmm. but coherent. But I was like, fuck these guns. I'm not doing like that's the last thing. Like fuck them. I went home, machete, jumped back in the car, got the boys to drive me. Whiteman Street, stayed there until like I saw someone, and then like we were like in Whiteman Street in my car, thinking like not even mask. No, I did. I ended up um getting a bandana, but like it's your car. It's like the name, like not well thought out. And I see, and I end up seeing uh, one of the security guards knock off his shift. It's already like 7 a.m. It's light. He walks out. I wind down the window. I'm like, hey, man, you fucking work at, you work at Crown? Yeah, he's like, oh, no. Nah. I'm like, yeah, you fucking do. He's like, no. Nah. I'm like, yeah, you fucking do. I hop out. Now I'm just running down Whiteman Street trying to chop this fucking guy. With a machete out. With a machete out. <laughs> chasing him, chasing him. I'm like, I don't care who I get as long as I get one of them. You then that'll like that send a re- message. Yeah. That's going to be, I got one of yous and fuck yous. Mm. You know what I mean? I've had enough. We've, we, we've like, we're going to even the score, so to speak. Um, so that ends up happening and then like the boys grab me, oh, fucking the car, this, that, that I was fucking um Morris, Mauricio and uh and Sanchez. They drive me home. I get home. My parents are not there at the time. They're in the Philippines actually. Cause they they I'd come back and they were still there. I woke up at like four PM that day, just like uh hungover. Um, and it turned out that the Jacks no, sorry, my, my parents were in the Philippines. They were like at someone's house. The Jacks came over that morning, but I was dead. So no one opened the door. They ended up coming back. Because the they ran your plate or something. Yeah. yeah. And they come back like two days later and they knock on the door. My dad answers the door and he's like, what? And so anyway, I come out and they're like, yeah, look, we want to speak to you. We know you were involved in this, that. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, da, 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 da. They're like, yeah, well, look, you know, we, we're still looking for the car. Da, da, da. And some things aren't adding up because I'm like, the car's like out the front, like down the road, just thing. And I'm <laughs> like, if you've passed it, you would have seen it, dickheads, you know? So, but I'd already given the car, was sold the car to Sanchez at the time, and but he had left it there because he was drunk. So I'm like, whatever. And they're like, look, whatever, we're going to get to the bottom of We're going to get to the bottom of We're just still waiting to get warrants to get the footage from um, Crown. I'm like, oh, shit, if they get the footage from Crown, then I'm fucked, probably, you know? So at that time, I have was working at the IGA at the top of the street, 96 tram, yeah. St. Kilda Station. I'd just gotten a loan for 15 grand and I was going to buy a Honda, uh, a, a Honda Integra, uh, the old ones. And I'm like, fuck, man, I don't know. I don't think this is going to go my way. And I told my dad, I'm like, man, I'm thinking about just running to the, going to the fields and just jetting and taking off. He's like, yeah, I reckon it's a good idea. So he, kind of green lighted that and I left. I took that 15 grand and left. Mm. And I was like, fuck it, I'm not going to wait around like, because I wanted to go back for ball. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I also wanted to go back for music, going back to was there Philippine stuff? There was, um, but it was still early days. So I'm like, I'm rapping with the Burn City crew. Sorry, it wasn't for ball. It was for music. So I'm like, if I get this thing, maybe I can't go back into the Philippines. And then that, there goes like mm. my music career because I was kind of looking at Philippines like, I think I should go there. There's a bigger market. Yeah. And so I took the music and I told the Burn City boys, I'm going to go, I'm going to represent us, I'm going to do this and that. And so I went and I, I spent a year there. And um, that was the turning point of like a lot of things of chilling me out because it's poverty, it's slum. Mm. I realized that I've got it good, man. Yeah. Like, the yeah. Isn't that bad? It's yeah. not. And um, yeah, look, you know, like my saying is, is like, yeah, I grew up. I, I didn't grow up the hardest, but I grew up hard, you know, because there's way more people in the world that got it harder. Mm. In terms of like the context of Australia, yeah, it's it's kind of as hard as it gets. After that, you're basically homeless, mm. you know, but it's like, man, still, I got it good compared to this. So that percep- that perspective stuck with me. I, like whenever things got tough, I was just like, bro, at least you got a bed, at least you got hot water, at least you got this. 
count, I counted my blessings. Like it made me more inclined to for God and so this is where the spiritual sort of faith comes yeah from. It's like it was firstly spiritual and then it went to Christianity and God but it was like man you know like like I could have been born here but I wasn't my sister was born here right like lucky we like mm. man we we're born in one of the best cities in the world you know livable city six seven years in a row like and even if you do have a tough year man if you want to you there is housing there's all sorts of there is there's a lot of if you want to um and you know, you're not in your own head because obviously that's a thing that you need to so get get around first that there is opportunity here. That's the thing. So if you're in a, if you're just a kid in the slums in the, in the Philippines or any third world country, what opportunity do you really have, right? Your network is your net worth and I understand that and that's something that I'm trying to create moving forward here to like in 2024 is that I understand that if you want to do better, you need network and we tend to in housing and the bottom it's like you just network with other people within and no one's really going anywhere there's a class system there that's unofficial though do you know what i mean that, there is and that's what i realized i'm like you know all right i want to do this but where do i go who do i speak to because it's very easy for me to like let's say now like if i was a young kid to it's easy for me to network and get in a gang or patch up and get in a bikey club but like how do i become like the manager of like sony you're like you know, I could tell you how to become the president of a bikey club or, you know, start your own gang or start a criminal empire. But like, that's not fucking great. Yeah. And how do we actually connect the two? And, and obviously middle class isn't going to look and I don't, they, you know, do, are they inclined to like, oh, we should help these guys. Like, yeah. unless you've got family in it, but it's like, are they inclined to really like, I don't know, like, should I care? Should I not? I've got my own problems to deal with. So it's like, we've got to figure this out at this bottom class. And a lot of people don't, man. That's yeah. what we say. We've shared stories. Like some people haven't figured it out. Well, that, and that brings me to another sort of point, man. Like in the Philippines, you don't have the opportunity. Here, the opportunity is afforded to a lot of people that do want to. But it also enables people to stay in this loop and this cycle yes. of not getting out where some people live in the same housing commission house that their parents lived yep. in and have never moved out and their yep. kids will probably go and we're talking yes. three generations. Yep. And, you know, I thought to myself, when I see these kids in the Philippines and the slums, the guilt was bad. Like it was heavy. Like why am I so mad or why am I so this? Like, man, just be thankful. Gratitude. I just that, that got me into the state of gratitude that I'm always in no matter how hard it gets that I need to make the most of my position because if if I ask one of these kids hey do you want to trade places they do it in a heartbeat mm -hmm. and I'm sure that they'd maximize it so once I realized like hey Jace you got afforded to be born here and you have an opportunity. Yes, you're starting at the bottom, but at least that's the bottom of the world. It's just the bottom of Oz. And if you just do what you need to do, learn the information, get educated, stay out of trouble, you know, put in the work, uh, you can make something of yourself. And that's what happens. So I've, I'm maximizing that. And a lot of people in housing are just stuck in that because mm. I don't know how to get out. But they it is good for them. Because, they don't have any mentors. Yeah. They don't have any coaching. They've got no one... And or if anything, you get someone that comes into like the youth services, but they're not from the life. So then, you know, it's that guy, it's that teacher coming into class, and it's like, man, fuck off, idiot! Like you don't even know, like mm. you don't understand my life. Like that's how I felt. Yeah, I'm like, bro, you don't even know. You're not even from this life. But if yeah. I had someone who was relatable mm. to be like, yeah, bro, I know exactly what you're going through. Mm. I understand. I did this. I did that. Now look where I'm. I'm at. You know, that's my mission. Look where, I, look where I'm at. Not that I'm at a really spectacular place, but to where I came from, to where I'm at is, is very far. I've still got a way to go, you know, yeah. like a much way to go, yeah. you know. So it's like I could have been way 10 times worse, but it's like I've done a lot of shit, a, a good shit, been on stage, been on this, mm. met this, you know, like, like I've done a lot. Yeah, man. So when you come back from the Philippines now, there's another fire under your ass that says, okay, I've got to make the most of this and give the music thing a real good crack. Yeah, that's like 2012. Uh, you know, I dropped the first Slice mixtape. I'm hustling heavy. I'm like, man. Social make... media is there now, so you've got avenues to push it. We do, but it's like we don't know how to use it because it's just started. It's just like what do you do with this thing? Mm. Like Instagram, I remember just was starting. Yep. We just went away from like Facebook. Friendstar. And, oh, yeah. and uh, MySpace. MySpace. Yeah. So it's like, 
you know, no one's really, you don't know how to use it. You just like, oh, I'll put my music up, whatever. Um, I doubled down hustling. I, I get a, I get an office in, in, uh, in South Melbourne, Bake Shop. That's the label at the time. I end up um, creating an, a, a hub, you know, creatively. Studio, this, that. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm just... Financing it with money. That's from- right. But I'm hardly there because I got to go make the money and I got to do this. But now, but I'm connecting with other guys like, hey, man, let's push this thing. Um, and I ended up getting raided when I was in the Philippines. And this is another thing that, that actually happened to me. And this is where I started to just go super legit because I was like, if I ever get raided, like, and I dodge the bullet, then... Like that's going to be my cue to like, that's but This it. has happened a few times already when you get to this stage. Yeah, but never for drugs. Yeah, okay. You know, it's just been like violence or graffiti. Graffiti, violence, then it was drugs. So, but I'm in the Philippines. So I'm going, I'm going to, a, I'm going to, I get invited to go to a show in the Philippines. It was called Ar- Araneta Dreams. And I get um, uh, Mike Swift, shout out to Mike Swift. He's um, super popular uh, in the Philippines. He's from Brooklyn. I met him when I went first went over uh, and he introduced me and I was really hustling. Like that's where I learned the hustle from, from Mike and how to maneuver and just squeeze the most out of every day. So he, he, he ends up, uh, and I've known him since like, yeah, 2000 and, uh, 2006 to 2007, let's say. And, um, now it's 20, is it 2010? No, it's like, whenever the Araneta dreams was, it was like, yeah, 2010 or 11 or 12, something like that. And um, I end up transferring the business over to a mate of mine and I'm like, hey, bro, just take care of this and we take care of it and, and we count the cash and this, that and this, like 200K there and here's the product, blah, blah, blah. We put it at the safe house. I leave, I land in Singapore and I remember by and this is where I was becoming super conflicted because I was like, man, like I know this is wrong. I can't keep doing this. All I want to do is just make music and, and, and get paid for that. Like, why can't I just do this? What do I got to do to make this work? Like, I don't know. I know I'm talented. I know I can rap. I'm, I'm, I know I'm good, but it's like, it's what is it? You know, I got to figure this thing out. I pray on the plane as we're taking off from Singapore to Manila. And I just pray to God and I'm just asking like, you know, like I want to get out of this, but it's so easy to just do this thing right now but I know that it's not the right thing to do. But I just, I need something to happen to just like wake me up. I land in Manila. So I pray for a sign. I land in Manila um, in the morning. I wake up and end up getting a call from, you know, my missus. And she tells me that I've been raided. But you're in another country. I'm in another country. Yeah. So I'm like, oh crap. They didn't find anything and that's it, you know? So I take that as that's the the cue to go, you know? So I end up at that time, I was like, nah, that's it, I'm done. Um, I do there, uh, at that at that time, um, I do the show and, you know, it's, it's great. I'm like, yep, I'm just going to double down on music. I don't know what I'm going to do to make money, but I'm just going to have to, I end up like when I get back, I... I go to Paran Police Station. They question me of someone that I was associated with, bikey dude, and they just kind of warned me. They were like, "Look, you know, just be careful who you hang around. Be careful who you call your mate." So I was like, "Okay, you know, I don't know, whatever." They were giving me like a little like heads up, like whatever. But I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." So I'm done anyway. Mm. I've dodged the bullet, cash out, and I'm just trying to go all in. I end up like first Middle Park, first first job I went back to at like 27 was like paper run. Mm-hmm. I was like, man, I got no like. People are gonna be like, what have you been doing for the past ten years? Get a paper run job, three in the morning, waking up, throwing papers in Middle Park, like in the rain, ten bucks, ten bucks an hour, whatever. I was like, whatever I gotta do, like I, I gotta do what I gotta do. End up getting a job at Wise Guys Pizza, mm-hmm. corner there, Park Street, delivery. Then I end up getting IGA Deli. Then I end up getting forklifting. Like I just like I've got to make money. I've got some money saved, but. Yeah, from there, it was like, oh, i got to work this out, though, because music's not paying the bills. I get into network marketing. I learn sales. Like, I'm just upskilling at this point. Just yeah. what can I do to just, I don't and know. And you're always reading new literature, so you're trying to better yourself. Like, personal development hard, yeah. you know, like everything. Uh, 
John C. Maxwell, Robert Kiyosaki, Anthony Robbins, any but mentors, you know, Ty Lopez, you know, Grant Cardone's, um, you know, it's, you know, the Gary Vee nows, you know, like all of these things, I'm like staying on board. Like how, how do I do this thing? And it's also because people don't understand. It's like, Chase, man, you've been in this thing for like 20 years. Like how come you never made it? It's like, bro, it's not that simple. The music industry was shifting and changing. Yeah. And every time I was like kind of catching up, it just moved. It was like a moving target. It's yeah. like you go from selling CDs to iTunes, from iTunes to, uh, no, not even that, selling CDs to like Napstar, you know, yeah. what's happening? Like Giving music away. Giving music away. You're using old formulas in new times that don't work, that you don't understand. Then it's streaming. Then it's like this. Then it's that. And you're like, man, this isn't that. And then you've got a market that's not really hip-hop super friendly. And it's not big enough. It's not big enough. There's not numbers. Like just sheer numbers matter. Mm. So, you know, that's why I looked at the Philippines and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm still working it out today. And that's why my label is, you know, the label changed from Bake Shop to No Plan B. You know, because I was like, that's what this is for me. There, there is no plan B. This is it. I'm trying to make it rapping, building a label. I'm a, I'm a complete what I set out to do, regardless of what is happening in front of me. I'm a just a maneuver and overcome, just like I always have. You yeah. know that. But you can you can take those lessons that you've learned and apply them to other business things that may not be illegal. You know what I mean? Within 100%. that, I th- to make it in the music industry, anyone will tell you, man, it's fucking. It's, it's tough. difficult. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, all right, I've gone through some hard stuff. Like I can do this, and you know that's where I'm at today. It's like, listen, man, anyone can sell drugs, and anyone can do that. Like it is not. You don't need sales skills. Like drugs sell itself. If you don't get high, if you're on supply, all that stuff's very easy. But can you legitimately build a business? That's tough. That is tough. And that's where the res- – that's why I'm like I'm, – I'm setting out to prove that and I'm doing it um, – you know, I got to do it my way in the sense of like the integrity, the values, the morals, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to do no diddy deals and, you know, enter these doors that <laughs> – a satanic and you know what I mean? I'm not going to do it that way. Like it has to be done the right way. So once this point comes where you've realized you've got your fully, you know, got your faith kicking in now, it's all, you you know, do you see that there's negative sides to this business and this music and the content that you're not really about? Does that change the way that you... Yeah, yeah, it does, man. And that was difficult because as I was starting to go to church a lot more and, and, and understand the Bible and the Christian values, true Christian values, it was like... Yeah, it, it's it's conflicting. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things there that are like contributing to the degrading of the world, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like, damn, like that's tough because it's like some of my favorite artists, this that, and it's like, oh crap. And and you know, that's why when people ask me about, you know, what, what you know, what's your music? I mean, you know, for me, it's just like OG rap. You know, that's why I love this brand OG. Like they're from New York, but I'm just spitting my life, but. I don't tell you, it's kind of like the Bible where it's like people are like, oh, you know, the Bible is so gory and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, but it tells stories of the bad stuff so that you would know not to do those things and here's the hope in that, mm. right? And so my music is really been there, done that, and that's not the way, this is what we're doing. Yeah, and this, this, is the is the, this is the This is the way to go. Yeah. Like, and, and to be able to connect with you you know, my target audience, mm. which is people like myself from the life that I'm from. Spanian is someone who's doing a really good job of that. And that's how, that's how like tied in I am with the streets and the scenes because it's like um, his best mate, Columbia, if you look on some of his um, vlogs, is uh, a best mate of mine. And I didn't know Spanian until he became Spanian. Right. Right, because Columbia spent some time down in Melbourne. He got locked up here. You know, I helped connect him with some people that, you know, um, for jail stuff. And, you know, I would always take care of Columbia when he was down here and met him through a guy that went to school with us. And, you know, he was just a mad cunt, brother of mine. Mm-hmm. And um, Spanian obviously gets out of jail and starts doing rap and He's stuff. everywhere now, man. Yeah. And I remember when it was just like 100 followers, 1,000 followers, Columbia would shoot his videos and send them to me. And be like, what do you reckon? What do you reckon? Like, what do you reckon? Because I was already doing the rap stuff. Mm. Um, even though we were like doing whatever we were doing as back and forth from Sydney. But, you know, now it's like, oh, shit. You know what I mean? Like, Colombia and Spanian are best yeah. mates. And like, 
who would have seen that happen? But he's a perfect example of anyone's, when you're looking out into the world of like, well, who represents me? It's like, no one's represented me until Spanion came along. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's who I connect with. Yeah. And there's not many Spaniards. No. Like, why is it taking this long? It's because they're in prison, they're on drugs, they're dealing, they're not here. They're, they're not, in a cycle. They're non-participants in society. Mm -hmm. They're not in a job. They're not normal, mm. right? But then it's like as soon as Spanian decided to go, you know what, fuck, man, I might take this path now. It's like, oh, cool, you know? And that's what we want more. Well, I want more stories Sorry. of that. Someone like him couldn't uh, couldn't be who he is today without video streaming and the internet because he'd never have a platform 10 years ago. Never. So, so it, it, you can only have somebody like him when you have a phone in your hand that can fucking go, you know what I mean? That's 100%. It. Yeah. If not for that, he'd just be another boy from the hood, mm -hmm. you know, but he cracked the code and just became himself and – and you can see a lot of people just, it's like why, it's like a, you know, we ha we're enamored with the gangster movies and stuff like that. Even though you're not a gangster, you still love it, right? But, you know, you just want to, it's like, it's like zoo animals. You just want to watch it from afar, but you don't actually want to get involved, mm. you know, but you're like, oh, you know, it's hectic. And so, yeah, someone like Spanion is someone who I look at and go, man, you know, he's really blazing the path of like where I want to go, mm -hmm. you know, with it. Where it's like, he doesn't tell his stories to, boast or glorify and that's not the intention ever but i can't tell you how i got here without telling you about this because it would make no sense like yep. it's like me telling the story at the end but like don't worry about the beginning it's yeah, like yeah. that's the whole meat is that yeah you need that you need that oh i need to know that wow what you did give this? Us some perspective yeah give yeah. us a, like whoa you made it through what you did all and you still made it here. Like that's unbelievable. Yeah. 50 Cent, Jay-Z, like you guys, you got shot in our times and then did this and then now just recently did a world tour and sold out shows. Like that's that's amazing. That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. I think someone like Jay-Z or 50 Cent, you take hip-hop out of the equation, those guys would have been successful in whatever they chose to do. You right. I mean? Because at the end of the day, they're businessmen and they had that drive. 100%. And, and, and they learnt that business savvy from the streets. They were both. And that's why they're two of my biggest idols because I'm like, you know what? These guys were big-time drug dealers and they really transferred and made it into a new thing and applied it. You know, 50 Cent's book, um, recent book, um, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter, is amazing, you know? Like, it's like, it speaks. I'm like, man, he speaks my language. And he's telling you this is how you can do it. You don't have to do this other life. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that here because right now, man, it's 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 rampant, you know, mm -hmm. stabbings here and left, right, and shootings. I've never seen so many shootings the whole time. Yeah. Like it's just been shooting after shooting after shooting after shooting after shooting. And it's just like it's bad. Yeah. It's and it's probably only gonna get worse. But if these kids don't have anything else besides Bro, when I was when I was hustling, no one wanted to hustle. Everyone was like, "Oh, he's like that. Like dealing is bad." Now it's the girls didn't even like it. Girls were like, "Oh, drug dealer, like what the hell?" Now it's like they don't want nothing but drug dealer boyfriends mm -hmm. and guys that look like they're bikies, but really they're tradies. You know what I mean? Like because they've got tats and they're on juice and guy's never been in a fight in his life but it's like oh you know i look like i got a drug dealer boyfriend it's like it's a thing now mm. and it's not good no. because it's 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 leading these young men to want to go and do that and it's like and i know what you're thinking it's like yeah well jace you did it and i'm like yeah i did it because that was my environment yeah. like if you come from a really great home with both parents working that's a that's a that's a privilege man mm. like that is that's big like if i had two parents that could support me like with like while i could take time to think that would have been fucking amazing mm. but i don't fucking have that do you put it down to the, do you think you would have come to this realization without the the god belief stuff or do you think that that sort of pivoted you out of it you thought right from wrong this is not a thing that i need to perpetuate i need to stop this negative sort of fucking i th i think that solidified it um just to tie off what i was saying it's like you know when you go and choose to go do the bad shit when you didn't have to do it like that's just a dumb cunt move bro mm. like you didn't have to come here and do this. Yeah. You didn't have to come to the flats and join in and you could have just stayed in Brighton and lived and like there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? In fact, we're trying to get there and you're trying to come here. Yeah. It's, it is a funny scenario. With it's that. it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Like, yeah, you think it's cool over here, but we don't have a choice, bro. We're just here. We live here. Like you don't live here. So, you know, that's the other issue. 
those guys I don't really speak to in terms of like that's not my audience. But you know, you could if you're gonna take something out of that, like you don't need to prove not you already got a leg up, man. Like we started at the back of the pack, you're already kind of up to the front. Why would you come to the back and do yourself yeah. a disservice? Yeah. And fucking like, yeah, let's make it harder for myself, like a dickhead. But some people are just fuck ups, man. We've seen lots of <laughs> no, but we've seen I've seen lots some of kids of with them, the, with bro. the best chance with people family that have got money and they just you fuck don't it need, up and they just fuck it up, man. It happens a lot. A lot of private school kids do. A hundred percent, and that's the issue that they face. They're like, it's you know, no friction. They just fucking drop the ball, and you're like, bro, give me it, then, bro. Then. <laughs> give me it. You don't want it? I'll take, take it, it. You know, yeah. but they don't look at it like that. But they should, in terms of perspective, like actually, bro, like. I should probably make the most of it, which is what Philippines done for me. Yeah. But going back to your question, which was, um, yeah, the faith solidified what I was already thinking. Yeah. I already felt that if you're not going to be a part of, like, that's what I learned, like these little gems. Like if you're not part of the problem, you're part of the solution. There is no middle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Jace, you're not putting a gun to anyone's head. You're not chasing people down to take drugs. But you're a store on the corner that's open and one less store on the corner open is better than more. Mm. So choose. Are you going to be part of the problem or part of the solution? And then implementing faith. Um, but it got so bad where it was like, you know, this is, again, it was, it's, it's um, I got a line in a rap that speaks about it, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm sell I was selling to like, at, it got to a point where it's like my house in St. Kilda was just a crack den. Mm. My mum and dad are just puffing every, like daily. Like there's just people I don't know, and I'm selling to them, right? Like I'm selling to my parents because I'm like, well, better they get it from me, mm. right? Better they just get it from me than anybody else. Give it to them cheap. They're gonna get it anyway. I'm justifying this shit. Like it's not. It's 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 heavy shit, bro. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. when I when you gotta I gotta break the cycle, though. Yeah, and you know when it's like raps where it's like you know one of the raps I got is, um late night sitting in my car in front of my house staring at stars pondering on everything i overcame used to use the glue to mean to cut the coke couldn't find an overcane rappers yelling trap but they don't know the game i was selling crack to my family tell me you know the pain i was selling crack to my parents tell me you know the pain had to hide my feelings like i was playing a poker game poker game justified it at the time thought it was a noble lame better they get it for me but that was just a bogus claim had to hit the Hennessy on the weekends to slow the pain. From the concrete of Melbourne is where my roses came. Came to save my people from the struggle. Like when Moses came, Jason with an E get familiar, start to know the name. Like th those are the bars that are, you know, that it's like people might hear and be like, ah, he didn't sell great. It's like, bro, that's exactly what my mum will tell you that. Mm. You know, and that's nothing to gloat or boat about, but it's just like that's just the reality of it. They're trying to make money and sell and – what am I supposed to do anyway? Turn around to my dad. My dad knows what's going on. I can't lie to my dad and be like, no, nah, dad, nothing going on here. He's going to be like your little cunt. Like I was dealing before you fucking cough it up. Yeah. And that's why I moved out. Cause I was like, I, I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And then I moved out so I wouldn't see it. And then I would just be like, no, nah, I'm not doing it anymore. Right. But then I'm selling to my cousin and he's giving it to them. Yeah. I'm like, where does it stop? You know what I'm saying? That's so I had to make a decision and, getting raided and then all of that stuff was just like, again, I'm part of the problem. You know what? I'm going to sleep a lot better at night being part of the solution, meaning I'm not judging no one, whatever. You're going to get it regardless, but not get it from me. Keeps your conscience clean. I'm just going to close down shop and take my shop off the strip and whatever, you know, and, and that's, that's all I can do mm. is just not be a part of the, the problem. And, and adding Christian values to that, that really drove down like that's the way I'm supposed to live anyway. Did your family, did they deal with your, well, how did they feel about your, your Christian, you know, belief when you dived in, you were going to church all the time? Did they, did yeah. they think it was unusual? Or did they? Yeah, my mum, that's the reason why. My mum ended up joining the church. My dad died before that was too late, but she saw the change because I started applying because I'm that guy. Like I'll start applying stuff. I, I read it, I apply. I'm like, a lot of people just read and don't apply. I'm applying, I'm applying. So she starts to see the change. She's like, man, he's changed. He's like happier now. He's less angry. He's being way more respectful. Not that I was ever disrespectful because they'd whoop my ass, but I was just changing and they saw that change. Mm -hmm. And my mum was keen and I told her one time, like, yeah, I've just been going to church, Bible study. She wouldn't believe it. And, um, you know, that change happened and 
at that time when I really doubled down and started changing and I got baptized, my dad started to get sick. And that's when like we had already kind of like I'd made amends. Like I'm like, dad, like I forgive you for like, like it's all good. Like you just, you just played the best hand you were dealt with and you did the best you could. You know, my dad came from Scotland, didn't know his parents, had like his, his, uh, his gran, you know, dealt with like prostitute, like seeing his, like, if I remember correctly, you know, like the woman that was looking after him was like prostitute, you know, sleeping with men and him growing up in that. And obviously Scotland's a hard, rough place. And mm. he ended up telling us in, when I was in grade six, he, we were at our friend's, uh, like a cousin's house and Brighton and then he we were there he got blind drunk we drove from Brighton to South Melbourne picked my mum up he was just fanging it I'm thinking we're gonna die he's drunk as a skunk drink driving pick up my mum come home to the St Kilda spot and um you know he kind of like not locks us in the room but sits down in the he's crying he's sobbing and I'm like what the hell's going on I'm grade six and we're just sitting in the room and he's not wanting us to leave the room because he wants to tell us this thing and Anyway, he comes, he, he stops sobbing and then he just starts telling us about like all these people that he's killed. Fuck. And I mean, Wait, he just needed to get it off his chest. Yeah. Tells me the story like first time he was 15, this guy wanted to kill him in Scotland. He kills the guy in Scotland, leaves Scotland. By that time, my dad's got like three kids or something, you know, three or four, you know. Yeah, he's, I don't know how many kids he had at that time. Oh, like I've got, Scotland. yeah, because I've got brothers. I've got three brothers and a sister. So I don't know if it was all four of them at that time. Um, it must have been. But yeah, they've, you know, there was four of them. He leaves. That's what he tells us. Anyway, he's left because of that. Comes to, you know, Merchant Navy. He ends up coming here. And he was like a hitman for high. He's like killed this one guy at South Melbourne with this guy. This was like six men that I can remember. And I don't know what, like, that's a lot for a kid that's in grade six to fucking take on, man. And no wonder you've yeah. <laughs> tough, you know dude. what do you what do you do with that? No, nah, what hard, do you do man. with this information? Is it like okay, you know? And then it was like, and that was it, and it was like we never spoke about it ever again. Mm. But he got it to get it off his chest. Yeah, and then thinking about that as like, what does that do to someone? Mm. Like I know that my dad was a good guy, good heart, rough guy you know, was not to be messed with. But that till, the, till like his dying day was like, he'd go up to the snake pit, the George mm-hmm. or the lawn bowls and would just always carry his blade with him and, you know, just never left the house and, you know, was always just on, you know, and I was raised under that kind of stuff. But it's like, what do you do with that? And how, how did that like eat at his soul and, mm. and, and, and like taking a man's life? Don't know what that's like. Don't want to know. But, you know what I mean? He's heroin addict, this addict. Like, he'll take anything, man. He will take absolutely anything. Like, it's like... So, yeah. Well, what does that do to a person? And then how does that affect us as a family growing up? And then, yeah, you know, but cycle needs to stop and it stops with me. And that's awesome, man. You know, that's where that is coming to. But it's like, not many people... Like, I'm not the only story, right? There's, there's a lot of us that have stories like this, but it's like... Where are they? You know, are they still yeah. struggling with it? Are they have they worked it out? Are they still in the maze? You know, that's it, man. But you're out of the flats, yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's one step in the in stopping in the, right the direction. cycle, right? Absolutely. Is, in, in in the right direction. Changing your changing your environment, changing your surroundings. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and this is actually what I want to see. You know, I've said it to I've said it to Toe, but like you got to get out. You know what I mean? You got to put yourself in a position to to grow. It's like working out. Like get that weight under you. You know, if you're just lifting light weights, that's not, you know, you've got a progressive overload mm. is how you build muscle. So it's like you do that with life. Progressively overload yourself. I know you maybe don't want to, not just, not just Toe, he's obviously still in housing and, you know, I was only there. Like I'm one step away from going back to housing. You know, if I can't figure out the rent situation, it's like, where do we go? We got to go back to housing, which is probably 10 times harder now. You got to go back on the list. You got to go back on the list, you know, which is like, deep so you know that's bad but you know for people in housing it's like they've you've got to change the situation and and put yourself in a position where you need to earn grow be in a different environment yes it's easy to stay in housing and just pay the minimum and stuff like that but i mean no growth is going to happen from there and you know i really encourage you know encourage that getting that's the first step you yeah know? 
Well, the first step for any change is just taking the first step, which sounds corny as fuck. Yeah, but, but it's the hardest got... step. Yeah, well, it would be. It's the hardest step because then you start you know. to see some progress. Yeah, my mum didn't want to leave housing. It wasn't. She did not want to leave housing, and I couldn't leave her there by myself because people were like, "Oh, yeah, you still live with your mum." It's like, nah, man, my mum lives with me, bro. Mm. I take care of my mum. That's a thing that happens, and not just people with housing. I've seen kids that we went to primary school with and stuff, you know, I'm talking like dudes that are in their 40s now that still live at home with their parents. Yes. Like, and whether or not they're in housing or whether you're in a private house that their parents might own, that's not living your life, man. Get no. out there and do something. 100%. And you got to do it and it, it starts with information and like when I think, you know, what's the difference between, you know, um, me and Ho have these chats and it's about like, shout out to Ho. Um, brother from day one, uh, brother from another mother, day one, and um, good skateboarder, good skateboarder, um, and you know it's like you know how did we get here and why did others not? And a lot of it was we're super competitive, we want to be number one at whatever we're doing, and personal development, just that, that changes everything. Personal information changes your situation, and so without those books that I read and taking them on board and changing my mind and growing the mindset and having a growth mindset and not a fixed mindset, which is a lot of hood people just have this fixed mindset. It is the way it is. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. It's just all victim, 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 victim. Mm. But you're only a victim until you realize that you can not be a victim. And like, yeah, you got given a bad hand, but you can still play the hand. And then guess what? You could get another hand. Mm. Like that's not the only hand you've got. You can play it and then get another hand. So I just kept playing, I guess, until I got a better hand, you know, and then you start winning a couple of games and, you know, obviously poker trivia, you know, you, probably, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you play, they, you can bluff your way and there is many aspects of like chess and poker and basketball to like, hey, man, yeah, you might be down. This is what I told Toe. I was like, bro, like I know you're feeling like it's kind of like, we're older now. Like, I don't subscribe to this. Like, oh, I'm old. Like, nah, bro. Old is like 93. Like, I'm 38, man. You know what I mean? Like, I'm feeling better than ever. I'm stronger than ever. I'm in the gym. Like, I'm not buying this. Oh, I'm just old and this is what it is. It's like, if anything, I'm in the second quarter. Mm. That's like me giving up in the second quarter of four quarters of basketball. Like, bro, I'm not even going to give up at the last one second. I'm, I don't care if we're getting beat by two. I'm that annoying guy that's deeing you to the very end and you're like, fuck, oh, man, just give it up just already. Just foul him, foul him. We'll get two shots. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Like, nah, nah. It's all the way until the siren goes. Yeah. Like, I don't want to see anyone putting their head down. You know, we've won championships together, me and Maloney, you know, at Swamp. Like, it's like we're going. It wasn't a great standard. It wasn't but it was a great, <laughs> you know, but we won finals was... together, you know, yeah. with with some decent guys there, yeah. you know. So with, um, I think it was Ravens. Ravens, yeah. You know, but it's like it takes it takes a certain mindset. You know, to grit through and grind through certain things and whether that's at the highest level or whatever, I mean, you know, you get to like, you've got to play through these things and yeah, I feel like, you know, we had that desire to, to want to win, man. Did, you have, you, have, you, have you mentored people with this positive mindset? Because it seems like you really, if you're yeah. not, you're, you're, you should be, man. Yeah. yeah, you know, and I'd love to write a book one day and, you know, I want my music to reflect that and and give hope to those. And I get a lot of that, man. I do get a lot of that in my DMs and inboxes. I haven't been super active lately due to legal cases and I'm trying to set up other stuff and, and build a label and a lot has changed in social media and I'm trying to keep up and I, I'm a one-man army. And, t you know, I've got a little bit of a team, OG Phil, um, Clariah right now. Shout out to Clariah Boss. But, you know, like there's not a lot of us and we have to do everything. So, you know, I can't just be rapping. So... That being said, I still rap and I still got music that's in the vault. Um, mentoring my my closest boys around me, Ruben, you yeah. know, was one of them. Yeah, you know, uh, any any of the boys that were just around, whether that's Sanchez, that's who I've really tried to build up is the closest around me. Um, and as I've gone further into this, I want to create programs mm. where I could bring other guys who have transformed and a good podcast is um well it was called the felon show but i think it's called the fresh start yeah i don't know if you've seen it yeah yeah i have um he speaks but, to a lot of ex-cons and that sort of right thing. who yeah. have like tried to change and mm -hmm. they're doing their thing and yep. we need more of that and i want to kind of i want to come in and participate in that and mm -hmm. bring more of that spanion the felon show or the fresh start it's positive shit positive stuff that's like listen we've got a real story to tell this isn't fake this is all real 
and you can relate to it if you're in a position of what we were mm-hmm. and you can use that as hope to be like, well, man, if mm. – I mean, you watch the fresh start of the felon show uh, – there are some guys that are just like they should never have made it out. They sh- they had odds stacked against them, and and they're here, right? Yeah. They've made it to where they've made it to, and they have no business being here, but they're here, and you could do that too. So you know, um, currently it's just like my inner circle. I had some young boys from like Noble Park that I was working with. Shout out to Ron, Ron Gerald, mentoring them. You know what I mean, Little Mark and. Just whoever I can, whoever's around, you know, I'm always in part. I'm always giving that game. Yeah. And now I'm like, well, I got to jump on like podcasts and because I can't just do this one on one with you from this like to reach or, a bigger audience, reach a bigger audience, you yeah. know, which is why I want to, you know, I'm going to venture into my own podcast and stuff like that. But yeah. So we've spoken about a lot of your journey, but we haven't even really touched on some of the acts and stuff that you have supported, man. Some <laughs> yeah. big names. Do you want to break some of them down for? Yeah, bro. Um, so, you know, I mean, I've, I've, off the top of my head, you know, support active for like Bone Thugs, Onyx. Um, and Onyx were some of the ones that you were inspired by early. Yeah. So that must have been a good moment, man. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Lick Nuts. Um, who else? Uh, you know, recently Tiger, YG. Um, there's a few others in there I can't remember, but um, there's some big names there, man. Yeah, um, and then I was recently with Onyx, like mm-hmm. last year, like I ended up getting a call to help them out, um, and yeah, just kind of just helped out with a little bit of their shows and stuff like that. But you know, really got to kick it with Fredro Star and, and Sticky Fingers, and you know, yeah, it was cool as man. They were so, they were so cool, and yeah, definitely because they were definitely the group that really inspired me as a in 1995 as a like grade four you know um i've kicked it with fat joe randomly Mm -hmm. you know that i was in a network marketing thing and he was in this network marketing thing and i went to a seminar when he was here and connected with him and went to the studio and didn't do anything with him but i ended up playing ball with one of his boys from from the bronx and we i took him to msac yeah right and he was i think i saw that on social fat joe took the video he was there well, he ended up coaching us. That's bro. right. I saw so that. So people were like, on, yeah. yeah, you know, when I've got that <laughs> diss with um with uh Melbourne, right? And I'm like, um, I kick it with real rappers like Fat Joe, I stack dough. Um, that was that line because he came. Like he ended up, he was saying, Oh, I'll come watch the game, but I didn't think he was gonna come, bro. I thought yeah. it was just gonna be me and his name's TA. And he was like, Yeah, I want to play ball. So I brought him. So we just played and we he played with us, and all of a sudden Fat Joe walks into MSAC with a few of the Terror Squad boys or whatever. And He's like, yeah, and he starts coaching, and I'm like, this is Fat Joe, Rucker Park, Co. Mm. Like, I'm like, man, this is crazy. So, you know, that was a, that was a dope little experience. Um, but you know, meeting like Method Man and Red Man back in the day, you know, selling truth to Method Man, Red Man, uh, Mob Deep, you know, all types of, you know, uh, the Alchemist. You know yeah. what I mean? Because I was also looking at that, like, saying, oh, that's how if you're like the weed guy, you could. Like that's a connect. That's yeah. a connect, and maybe if I'm that, and I could connect. And when I had my first slice, 2012, um, my mate took me. I don't know how he had. Uh, it was Pete. Shout out to Pete, Pete M. Um, and he was like, "Yeah, bro, like Alchemist needs." So we went, and I handed him my mixtape, and then I saw him at the club, and I thought, you know, he's probably not gonna listen to it, whatever. Uh, but he ended up tweeting and, and like adding me like back then, and it was just like, you know, he 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 ended up like quoting a line from one of my songs awesome man. and i was like man that's mad still got the screenshot little things like that you know where it's like i really was in it and trying to do my best to like do support acts you know i did g unit you know i did um not not recently but i did tony yayo and lloyd banks as well um just support acting where i can but then you know a, you know a, again being pro artist and and being doing this for a long time, it's like, man, when do we really get paid? And when do we draw the line? And when do we stop paying dues and, you know, doing things for free? And so I got to a point of that probably like 15 years in where I'm like, listen, you got to pay your dues for like seven, 10 years. That's fine. But like, that's to be a point where a line is drawn and I need to get mm-hmm. paid for like, I've paid dues. Yeah. I've done thousands of hours on stage. I've done a lot in the Philippines. I've done a lot here. At what point, like, you're going to pay me the same as this guy who's just started last year and I'm 15 years in. That doesn't make sense and I'm not going to go for that. I'm going to start to try and create value for the artist. Because if I don't do that, like, who's going to do it? Yeah. You know, like, who's going to set the precedence? But is there enough 
slice of the pie to go around though. That's a thing. Not even, exactly. right? Depending on who you who you're at. But if you're doing these front acts, mm. you know, for bigger American artists yeah. as opposed to like locals, you would want to get paid at least, you know, something a couple of G's. respectable. Yeah. You know? So it's like those are the things that that I obviously fight for pro artist stuff and you know I'm definitely a big believer in paying your dues and you know you do that five five to ten you know five several years you got to be putting but there's in. no exact timeline man there's like, none yeah there's none you know you're right there isn't but it's like I think if you can get it to there like if you've been in the game for 10 years and you've been putting in work and it's very hard to sustain because the music industry is expensive even like podcasting right Absolutely. unless you don't own your own gear and mm. that's right you know so I'm going through that at the moment. I'm like, yeah. man, I gotta buy this, that. Do this. it from the start is my suggestion to you. Right. That's what I'm just from a personal level. As in, like, invest. I think so. If that's what you want to do, yeah. and you're someone that's not going to half-ass it. Yeah. But I did it the opposite way, where I was paying a lot for a studio every week, and then getting momentum, and I kept having to go back to the studio, and then I kind of take it a backward step, doing the DIY thing. Yeah. So I suggest if you do it, if you go all in, and you're someone who's not going to do it by half. Yeah. Then put the money in, set your own little space up where you can do it and just do it, man. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, might as well just invest even if the, you know, let's say it was an A7S three or whatever because I've got an A7S two, you can, and it's man, like – but I'm like looking at, you know, now it's like, oh, okay, you know, I could do it on something even cheaper. You can, man. You, know? you can. There's – I'll – after this, yeah, I'll, we'll have I'll a break chat. it down for you. Yeah, so I'm like, yeah, and, and this is a new space that's opening up. Yeah. And rappers and things need to – you know, that's why Spanion's great because he's like, well – he hasn't rapped in a long time. A lot of people don't even know Spanian raps. Yeah. And he's a he's a gun rapper, man. Spanian's one of the best lyricists out there. But do you know what's really interesting about his rap career is he wasn't listening to Aussie rap. He wasn't Either. listening to that, right? That's right. He wasn't he wasn't influenced by that. He was nah. just doing his own thing. He was just doing his own thing. Mm. And he had a hybrid kind of accent, like I would listen. But you know, um, he was just doing his own thing, you know, and then now it's like you know, he doesn't even really want to rap. And now it is just about personal brand and building a brand. Yeah. And now that's what I understand and that's what I encourage the artists to do. From what he – the way that he does it, and I've watched a lot of his videos on YouTube, he does a good job at shining a light on a lot of these shitty spots without just pinching from them and being like, this is a mad hood. He's like yep. sort of showing why this is bad and we need to fix it, not just like – He just yeah. came – he just uh, he just left the Philippines recently. He just yeah. Like he was there a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know. I reached out to Colombia and I was like, bro, like, like, let Span know, like, I've got people there, like, if he needs to tap in. But he was going to do an Into the Hood there. And this is the thing, because I understand that there is content from our neck of the woods or our side of the tracks that corporate, you know, Australia will take and do, you know, prisons or, or underbelly. And like, we don't capitalize off that right. in terms of like, we don't, we don't, um, we don't profit off of that. But they're going to take our stories, use it, and profit off it. Yeah. So it's like, why are we doing it? And this is why I love 50. Because he's like, nah, these are our stories. We're going to use our stories to capitalize like off. Like power and that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That there's like he's, and now he's got an old TV studio and employing uh, most of the black and, black and brown community. And it's like, oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Because here it's less about black and brown. It's just more about poor. You know, the whole thing of it's like... It's a different line. It's a different line, you know. It's like people was like... like I'm, I'm not someone that subscribed to the, you know, people of colour and this, that. I'm like, that was never an issue for us. It was just people of poor. For us, mm. if you were poor, didn't matter. You're from Paran. It's like we got every nationality there. Mm. We didn't see colour. We didn't see racism. We didn't see that. We just saw we're poor and the middle class was like oppressing us. You know what mm. I mean? And whether you were whatever colour you were, you were rich and snobby and thought you were better and we felt like we were lesser. You know, and didn't matter because we had all nations. And so for me, it's about... We can all be poor together. The, the language that we spoke is poor, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that was our nationality is poor. We didn't, we just happened to be if we had an Asian group or whatever, but we had Africans, Wogs, we had Aussies, we had Russians, we had everything. Like we had everybody, yeah. you know, it's like everybody from every culture, bro. Well, I, I, I always remember there was Aussie Paul because he was an Aussie kid that used to hang around. Right, it's just right? like he Aussie was, Paul. He was the outcast. Yeah. So <laughs> He's a good dude. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah, great dude. So, and, you know, you you have these, these uh, it's a melting pot. So we didn't look at it like that. And now that I'm looking at that, it's like I, I want to I take our stories mm. and profit off our stories yep. so that we can get a leg up. 
so that we can go and invest and do other things and build businesses yeah. and do entrepreneurship. You know, those are the things that I'm into. That's why I love Nipsey Hussle. That's why he's one of my favorite guys. Because he's about, yeah. Entrepreneurship. And, and the other thing is, I guess, and it comes with maturity, but you realize you can do more together than you can at breaking apart. You help each other up. Well, there's like, you know, you want to lift other people up rather than try and drag them down, you know? 100%. And maybe it's the basketball player in me, but I've always been a team player. Mm-hmm. Always been a team player, bro. Like I think about it and maybe that's a, maybe it's to my detriment sometimes mm. because I want to see everybody win. And I'm not someone who's selfish and just wants me, me, me. It's like I'm trying to take everybody who wants to come and if you – like I want us to win. I don't care if I don't score the most points. Mm. But get and, the most assists. Yeah, that's right. As long as we get the win, that's what matters because I know what it's like to score 35 a night and lead swamp in league leading. But You know, you're like Jason Keane, uh, 38 points per game, but now you're with the Redbacks and there's zero wins and 12 losses. Like, mm. that's whack. That's like a – I don't want that stat. Yeah. You can take the scoring champ, uh, title, whatever. I want to win, man. Yeah. You know, so I'm down for whatever's that. But when I see people from the area or, you know, that I'm connected with and they're not on the – the team train like that rubs me the wrong way sometimes and that's why I'm like themselves first in a sense which is nothing wrong with that I understand you need to put on your mask first put on others but when it's like when you're in a position and you've got a platform Mm. i.e summer jam i.e the issues that I had with bail it's like does it hurt to give some light to some people that are also trying to move in the same direction yeah so tell us, with, with Summer Jam, and for people that don't know, it's a basketball tournament that's happened in Paran for what, like 10, 12 years now. And what happened there? Like you've been involved for a while, but I don't think you are anymore. Nah. So, you know, we had a bit of a falling out due to them taking the name Paran out, Summer Jam, but still having it in Paran, which we, you know, I had an issue with that because we got involved because of Paran and it was the PSJ, right? The P stands for Paran Summer Jam. So without that, I wouldn't have given all my time and effort yep. for free and volunteer. Because it represents something so close to your heart. 100%, which you now know, going through a bit of this story, why Jace is self-proclaimed mayor of Paran, right? So because, well, no one else is right now and I'm just kind of in hope, you know, ho- pushing push hope. Like, uh, what's his name? Um, TikTok Gary, in a sense. I don't know if you've yeah, seen no, TikTok no. Gary. Hope Cartel. Dude. Hope Cartel, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm there to... to be the beacon of light for anybody that's in Paran. You know, I've still got mates that are there and whoever the young kids that I don't know, you know, that are like, oh, I don't know, he's from Paran Flats. You know, reach out if you want to, you know, people reach out for like, I'm dealing with a guy right now who's from the north, who's from um, Heidelberg, west. You know, he's from the hood and, um, you know, he's, and this is what happened with Ron. Gee, he's from Noble Park and he just didn't know what to do and he saw me as like someone that he could come to and he just hit me up one time, was like, hey, bro, can you check my music out? Um, and basically I heard it, I gave him my two cents and he it basically changed the course of his life and I don't look at myself as someone that's capable of doing that. But then when I look at like where I've come from in the streets to where I'm at in normal life, it's like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. And for like several years, he just stuck with me. And he's like, bro, like without you, I probably, I don't know what I'll be doing. I'll still be in a trap house. I'll still be doing this. So mentoring, you know, just like stick by me. Like while I fight this war, just stay with me and I'm figuring it out. Like I'm already like, I joke about it, but it's like, I'm like last of the Mohicans. I'm just like William Wallace up in here, just like battle scarred and like bloody and like this guy won't die. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no plan B. He's really going all the way. Like he's not going until he reclaims Scotland, you know. Um, and maybe that's the Scots in me. Yeah. You know, maybe that's the like the brave heart in me that I'm just like never say die, not rolling over. I don't know. Always been a fighter. Um, Filipinos are like that as well. But, um, you know, that's the um, – where was I going? TikTok, Gary, Hope. um the f- we're, st- we're talking about Summer Jam. You know. Summer Jam. So they take the name Paran out and that's like basically taking us out. Mm. And you take that personally. Yeah. You know, because people have Paran tatted on them. The name, the postcode. People have died for Paran. People have gone to jail for Paran. People have killed for Paran. Like literally this is what has happened, you know. 
growing up, there's been blood, sweat and tears for the name Paran and the respect of the area. And because what is there to really, to, you know what I mean? When mm. back in the day, if you're thinking Paran, you're thinking the flats and it's a scary place and you don't just walk around or walk through that place. Like this, it's a, it's a brand. You know, I remember growing up, it's like, it's a bad place, you know, that I ended up becoming really entrenched in because my best friends are from there. But it's like, we were dealing with, you know, Chapel Street, everyone doing chaplats, coming from other areas, disrespecting yeah. the area, or, you know, acting like they own it and you're out and they might start someone, but little do they know there's 30 dudes at the basketball court. Now it's every 30 dudes running out onto Chapel and now they're getting cleaned up and it's like, you know, you can't come around here just thinking you own Chapel Street. You but know? it is like everyone's playground. Though. It is, right? So, But it's like there's, we're the locals mm. of mm. the land. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, if you're going to get smart, don't get smart to the locals. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like getting smart to the Aboriginals. It's like, oh, you know, it's like, bro, what do you, you know what I mean? It's their, show some respect. This their hood. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. show some respect, you know? So, but we understand the politics and the, and the, and the what do you got? The, the inner workings of street stuff, you know? But that's what it was. We fought for that. You know, and Chapel Street Festival getting wild, it gets shut down. And that was a fucking mess. It was every a mess, year. man. It was it a mess every year. You no know, wonder like, they stopped it, dude. It was too wild, yeah. you know? So it's kind of like the best way that I could put it is like you're waving the Paran, like let's say you're a, you're a crip and you've got this, you know, you're pretending to be this crip and you're waving the flag because it gets you good branding points. People think you're accepted by it and they don't mess with you and this, this, that. Then when it's convenient for you, you get rid of it and you don't represent it. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. You got to capitalize and benefit from all of that. Yep. And then now when you're going into the best part of your career, it's like, let's get rid of that. Do you think it's because they wanted to make it bigger than just Paran though? Like it was a marketing exercise? I had the conversation and it was, it was a marketing ex exercise. Right, it was like we just kind of want to commercialize it, but that doesn't like how does that take the name Paran shouldn't take away from the commercialism, right? Mm. It's Harlem Globetrotters for a reason. It's not just the Globetrotters. So we saw it as we want to take Paran Summer Jam to the world. Yeah. Like you want to take Summer Jam, the basketball side. The we want to take Paran the hood with you. So can we go together? You know, mm. and that's what we were invested in. That however, wherever this goes, we're together. So when you kind of kick us out the car, then you, it, un, like with no communication and it's just, hey, what, what? it's not a parent summer jam, what the hell? Bro, I made two music videos, four music videos, two anthems early on, Paran summer jam, anthems. I made them with my own money, own resources, own time. To promote it. To promote the Paran summer jam. Mm. I never got paid for those things. No, they didn't even ask me to do it. I did it because I wanted to, and that's the thing I was bringing to the table. Not only that, I MC. I'm an original MC of the Paran Summer Jam for several years. You know, you got a Paran boy working in Stonington, in Ho, helping. There's two Paran boys here helping this thing. So it's, Paran is very deep in this. If it's if it's them two boys and us two, like we're helping here a lot. Mm -hmm. So you know, what do we want? But that was like, okay, look. Let's just make sure that Paran is still represented since it's the flats are in the background, all of those things. We just still want representation. It became an issue because they ended up doing a Foot Locker ad which showed the flats, which was great, but they didn't have any of us in it. It's like you use the same, uh, you use the same angle that I use, which is what I was showing. I'm like, this is my angle that I used that I took from somewhere else. It was like a Nas video, but they, Foot Locker wouldn't have known that. Mm -hmm. You know, they would have used my stuff and being like cool so plagiarism's happening i'm not getting any credit for anything you could have just included me in there was so many people in this ad that was like who are they and like you could have had any of us there you would have just told me like hey jace jump in thanks for helping us thanks for helping us and doing so much free stuff for us and throughout all the years just running with us like do you want to jump in the Foot Locker commercial hell yeah i'm still active i'm trying to yeah yes please that'd be great Whatever, in the background, I can just be like, yeah, I was in the ad. I could get some of the boys, like, yeah, that will represent. So we've got some of the generations of like, if anyone watches, it's like, oh, they really are. They're, those are the Paran boys. Like, that's dope. That didn't happen. They make a Paran Summer Jam mixtape, which I, it was my idea from 2012 to want to make. I was going to make hard copies. 
Mm. But again, out of my own money, I wasn't going to do it. I wanted to try and get a budget. Like, let me make it, put it together. It's a Paran Summer Jam mixtape. Doesn't get made 2012, but ends up getting made in 2022, last year or two years before, ago. Yeah. And it's like, I already told them the year before, like, hey, man, Paran Summer Jam mixtape, let's do it. They were like, yep, 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 let's do it, da-da-da. I, they get someone else to do it. Didn't bring me in on the project. And it's like, how are you going to make a Paran Summer Jam mixtape when no one from Paran's on it or no one from Paran is heading what the sound should be yeah. of Paran? But they're, they're removed Paran from their name at this point, so they're trying to distance themselves from it altogether, though, so it kind of makes sense? No, well, yes, but no, because the mixtape is called the Paran, Paran Summer Jam okay. mixtape. All right, yeah, fair so enough. So it's not even just the Summer Jam mixtape. Yeah. Okay. So there are the nuances. If you just called it the Summer Jam mixtape mm -hmm. and you didn't have an... Uh, if, and, and you didn't have the specific spotlight on the flats, okay, because there was flats and 3181 and specifically the flats yeah. and Paran. People try to be like, oh, it's a Summer Jam mixtape. It yeah. says it clearly, Paran Summer Jam mixtape. So you're just upset that they're stealing from what the essence is and not giving it back. Correct. Right. That's right. And what's the give back? Put some of us, you know, yeah. two of the... Doesn't need to be financial even. Doesn't need to be. It's opportunity. Mm. I'm good with that. Enough of... I'm good with opportunity. You give me a, like, there are artists from Sydney on this thing. Like, like most of it wasn't even from our area. It should be Paran first, other areas second, and then you could go out to Australia if we can't fill it up. We don't need to give Sydney more credit than they already have. They've got their own thing. And that's no hate on Sydney. It's just but... Like, why aren't we doing our own thing? Mm. Why are we like, oh, Sydney's popping, so let's do that. Let's so, bite them. So, and there was, did you reach out? You voice in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely sort of reached out. But, no, but at that point, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to pick up the phone because that's what I did last year because now it's already the boat sailed and, and plagiarism's happening. Ideas are being stolen. And I'm like, no, nah, I need to speak out about this so that the truth is coming out and you can go and make the assumptions for yourself. Like, why is Jason arcing up? It's like... Bro, you, you take something that we invested in and that's why the reason why we were there. You remove it, cool. We say, cool, just keep us involved if it's anything Paran. You say yes. You go and do the exact opposite. Then you, you, you're like, oh, but you know, you can perform. Uh, perform. I'm like, cool. I didn't even know about the mixtape. The girl that was spearheading it at the time, because I started to turn it into, oh, Jace is like bashing on this girl. It, ain't, it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a guy. It didn't matter. You dropped the ball on it. I'm calling that out, that you dropped the ball, whoever you are. And you didn't do your due diligence. You've got two of the best rappers in this country, in Paran, myself and Clariah Boss. Lyrically, you can like bar for bar, like Clariah's a machine. She should have been on it. I should have been on it. You got Steve Zeus from Paran. There's producers that could have been on it. There are people from the area that could have been on the Paran Summer Jam mixtape, but weren't. So why not? Because the person in charge didn't have any idea. You could have just been like, Jace, we're putting together a Paran Summer Jam mixtape. We want you to spearhead it. We know that you've been wanting to do this since 2012. You told us last year you wanted to do this. So here it is. And you could have been like, can you work with her? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's not hard, but apparently it is. You know, so they dropped the ball on that. Then they're offering me a low fee. Then I'm like, I was earning more when you paid, when you paid me in like 2015, 2016. So why has it gone down? Mm. You know, but that was the least of it. But it's just a lot of disrespect was happening, whether it was indirect or direct, which I think to be honest was indirect. But it still doesn't. Unintentional. Unintentional that they just weren't thinking. Right. But the point of me raising it is so you think, mm. so it doesn't happen next time. Think. Can they reach out and try and fucking build it and make amends here or is the relationship too far gone? Um, I've been wanting to have the conversation for a long time, but I've been hearing whispers of like, well, if he, you know, if he wants to come talk to us, he can come talk to us. I don't like that arrogance of like, well, he can come talk to us. That's what I did the first time around. That's exactly what I did. Picked up the phone, called and just had the conversation. But it's like, You've done wrong and dropped the ball. You should be picking up the phone going, damn, we, 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 we didn't do the right thing. Mm. Let's call Jace. You could have called me in the midst of it and been like, Jace, I know you're mad. I know you're upset. We didn't see it like that. Fuck, we're sorry, bro. Can we talk about this later? I would have, I would have been like, yep, sweet, all good. Mm. And that's all it was. But instead it's been 
avoid, avoid, avoid. And I understand because they don't like conflict. They're not from the same cloth that I'm from. They think that they're scared to have the conversation, you know? Um, and I understand why they would be, but it's like nothing's going to get done. I don't know if this this new generation doesn't want to talk about it, whatever. It's just like have the convo, man. Like have it. Mm. Communication is key, you know, but I'm not going to sit there and call you because I don't really need to do that. Yeah. What I am going to do now is just big bro you and call it out. And if you're, if the truth makes you look bad, that's on you, bro. Can't be like, oh man, don't tell them all of that. You can argue it if you want, but I tell you, if you all get us in the same room and we speak about it, the heads are going to be like this, you know? So, you know, they can be like, oh, I don't know if he's going to call us out. And this is obviously not just me. There's been many people that have been slighted by Summer Jam. But even like to now, it's like I just saw recently, like, I don't know if I want to clear it up with them. Yeah, fair enough. Like, I don't need to. I know that they don't need to. But then it just means that whenever it's brought up or if I'm going to speak about it, I'm just going to tell you what happened. This is what it is. Yeah. You know, I can give you all the, everything's there. You can make your own judgment. You know, that's, that's really it. You would think that the right thing to do is be like, man, Maloney's been with us for so long. He's still doing his thing. He's still trying to break through the maze and this, that. Now we've got Jordan Brand. Now we've got Foot Locker. Da, da, da. This would be a good time to throw him an, an assist. Mm. That's what I would do. And that's why I'm talking about, I think that my downfall and weakness is that I'm about us and the team. Mm. And that when you're working with people that are about them, that doesn't translate. And I understand that not everyone is a team player. Yeah. And is it because too much corporate and too much money comes into it? You know what I mean? Like, is that what it is? Is that the motivation? Yeah. You know, there's those conversations, you know, and that's why I would want to have like, well, why? I know you guys are making changes to appease the corporates. Yeah. And that's where we also have a value difference. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to appease them in terms of like, can we negotiate? Yeah, of course. But if it's like, hey, you know, do something completely like that's unnecessary, like take the name out of Paran Summer Jam, it's not necessary. I understand that it's probably less of a mouthful to just say Summer Jam. And that's why I was like, cool, just make like, you know, when you have the court, if you go to like, Perth or Sydney, it'd be dope if you just had like Paran on the baseline and Paran on the baseline and then like Summer Jam, you know? You could just, you could change the Instagram. But as long as we're still being represented, mm. but not just that, that the people from Paran, especially the flats and those that fought for this name are actually included yep. and make decisions over that. It's like, let's make decisions. Let, let's ask white people make decisions for the Aboriginals and not consult them. Yeah. Use it all be an uproar. But when it comes to things like that, it's like, oh, that's different. No, it's not. It's, it's exactly the same in the sense of we've been here, we've been representing this, this is our thing, not like that we own it, own it, like, but like we've been here, yeah. you know? So just do the right thing and we've helped you. We put bricks in this house. And so for repayment, it'll be like, hey, man, jump in a Foot Locker commercial. Jump this, hey man, do you want to do the show? Bro, I know we were paying you like 500, bro. We'll pay you 1500 this year. Like, our thanks for shooting two music videos and spending your time and just a thank you, bro. Yeah. So, and you feel just like the whole thing's been handled disrespectfully. That's it. That's where it's the core of it is, is that. Disrespect. And I don't do well with disrespect. No. You know, and so obviously that's... for reasons of like, that's why I was always, I never took disrespect. Mm -hmm. And I still don't today, but I'm more amicable that it's not just going to go straight to violence instead it, it wouldn't even like it's not even worth it like that's not what we're going to do mm. i will be firm in what i'm saying but you know in terms of like you've got an opportunity to give opportunity especially to those who are still people of poor in a bottom you know we're not like you don't think that you don't think that i still have homies that are still struggling that would want to like it's not just about the kids yeah, the kids too, but like every, like whatever age, man, there's 40 year olds out here struggling with mental health and have talent and need a opportunity and, or, or no, or do we just be like, ah, he's, well, don't, don't worry, mm. you know, let's just look after those that aren't 40, you know, I don't see it like that. I think it's all equal opportunity from wherever they need it, you know? So, and again, maybe not everyone sees it like that. Again, I'm that much of a team player. But you've got to be honest to yourself and that obviously, you know, is the only thing you can do. you just got to be honest and you're coming at it from a very – you've taken it personally, so you've got to be honest. Yeah, that's right. And it's like – and that's the only – that's the only – I've never had issues with them besides that. It's all been love. 
and they haven't ever disrespected me like intentionally and I know it was unintentional they just wouldn't have thought about it because they wouldn't be operating and thinking about it but that's fine you know um but I wish them the best of all success and you know I want to see them you know do their thing I don't want to see them not do well yeah. you know so anybody that's like oh he's just hating it's like nah man I've told him to their face like I want to see you guys you think I don't want you guys to be successful that's what all I've ever wanted mm. like no one can like I wouldn't have done what I did if I didn't want you to win with with distancing themselves from the Paran name does that leave it open for you to do something else at the Paran courts yeah. with the Paran name like it seems like there's 100%. an opportunity there. yeah I've, I've thought about it and that's something that's been done it's obviously my hands are tied behind my back because of you know the legal stuff and I'm like I don't think I'm gonna have the time to do that right now but yeah absolutely that kind of put me into a position like you know what maybe I'll start something that is more in line with the values of what I think it should be for us, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that could be something that, you know, we can do later. But that's, yeah, 100% we've thought about that. Um, and, you know, the scene would do well with it, you know. So I've got some ideas around that and um, spoken to like DC from MSF about it and that's something that we can work on. But, you know, I need to get through all the other stuff that I'm getting through at the moment. But, yeah, absolutely, man, that's that's something that would, would, would be done. And if Summer Jam does it wherever else, Good on them, you know what I mean? I don't I don't have any issues with that. But when I see things like now, they, they're killing it, man. Like they, they got a little pop-up store. I don't know if it's a pop-up store, but they got a store in Burke Street and Jordan Brand, Summer Jam, the logo. I'm like, man, that's dope. Like you don't think that us as Paran boys wouldn't have loved that mm. to be like, bro, we got Paran on the thing. I know that that's how they're feeling because Summer Jam is, is what they represent, right? But it's like Paran on a Jordan thing would have been – amazing not even just for Paran boys if you're like from St Kilda Bala yeah. you know it's like wearing Bala you know what I mean it's like you're along for the ride you're like man that that's us yeah. you know that's us and it's like that would have been dope but you know we got robbed of that but that's fine you know what I mean but like it is what it is you'll move on yeah we're gonna we're gonna do our own thing anyway but um yeah you know that that's why You've sort of touched on you want to start your own sort of podcast thing. Do you want to tell us what else is coming up for little Jace in the future, man? Yeah, so we've got no plan B, the label. I'm still working on my stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm working with Clariah Boss. She's from the flats. So just kind of putting the manager hat on and the business hat on and pushing her stuff. You know, we just had a show um, out in um, District 14 in um, Nary Warren. HP Boys were the headliners there. She was a support act. So we've got Clarice actually doing um, Summer Jam, right? So we negotiated that. She's doing um, Summer Jam through Steve uh, Zeus. Shout out to Steve. And um, and he's from Paran as well. And, you know, we're, we're doing that and then we're going to work on her shows and I'm going to um, – obviously we haven't touched on the legal stuff. Like I'm, I'm going to be going away for a bit, doing a bit of time for – the thing that happened and um, I'm trying to put myself in a position where I can run this thing from inside. You is know? that an option? Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, look, the way I see it, if these guys are running hundreds of million dollar drug empires from inside, from like max security, I can run a legit business. Um, now at this point you're getting like three Zooms a week, two hour Zooms, that's six hour of Zooms. So it's it's essentially laptop life, yeah. Right. If I can, which then puts me into a position to be a better operator and delegating because I literally am behind the walls and can't do anything. Yeah. All I can do is put teammates in place and do things like that. So I'm setting up the label. There's three components to No Plan B. It's No Plan B, the like the music label. It's No Plan B, digital marketing stuff. And then there's no plan B events. And those are the three things, the synergy that's going to happen. So doing events to, one, make money, two, create networks uh, with people local as well as celebrities. The digital marketing side of thing is to be able to master social media and things like that, to be able to promote and advertise and mm -hmm. get your stuff famous. And then there's the music, which is really the, the heart and soul of it. Um, but, you know, it might even go into like, influencers and you know i've had talks with columbia like he wants to do something doesn't know what to do i'm like man i'd love to manage him and 
you know, basically turn him into another Spaniard in a sense because it's like, man, you guys still do stuff together. It'd be dope if you had your channel and he had his channel and, mm. you know, stuff like that. So just getting into that section and entertainment and, you know, th there's a lot there. My own career, but, you know, my own career has to take a, a seat for the next couple of years and that's fine. You know what I mean? You, you make your bed, you sleep in it. And, um, yeah, man, there's lots coming up. But Do you want to break down why you having a vacation? <laughs> yeah, like, I yeah. don't know if you want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we could talk about it. I'll go into just what's there already. But, you know, in 2020, height of the lockdown, I ended up getting arrested, um, raided feds, drug task force. Um, was inside for just less than a month, got bailed and... Ever since then, I've just been fighting the case and it's been like three years. My hearings end of the end of February. Um, you know, we, we had a sentence indication. I fought off. It was looking at like high, it was looking at like high single digits at one point. Like eight, nine years. Yeah. You know, like 12 with a nine and, Fuck, man. you know, so it was, it was serious. Mm. Um, and I I was I'm like I'm not copping that, you know. So I'm gonna fight. So I got some I got a good lawyer, good barrister, and uh, fought for the past three years. And we got we got one of the most important pieces off, which was um, the listening device that was in this apartment at the time. And you know, for whatever reason, prosecution didn't want to go on with that argument. So and the cops tapped your house, the apartment, mm -hmm. the the apartment that I was in wasn't yeah, yeah. mine. And um, yeah, they did camera and all, right? Wow. So, and we got that out because that was really the most damning stuff. So they conceded to that and that removed it. And, you know, we're sitting at about like five with a, with a three, which for anyone that doesn't know jail terms, it's five on top, three on the bottom, meaning five years is the most that you'll serve in terms of like total, including probation, like three years prison and then two years pr uh, parole. Mm -hmm. I mean, but if you fuck around, you'll do the whole five. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to get it down a lot more than that. But, you know, the judge has pretty much indicated like it's looking like that. Mm -hmm. Three years is, is three years. Uh, you know, I mean, I think about it. I'm like three years has gone since the pandemic. So it's gone quite quick. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, I don't know if it'll go fast or quick inside. Um, but, I, you know, I'm going in with a plan and I think, there are a lot of people facing jail time right now for whatever the reason. And um, people probably ask me like, well, what would you get, you know, what, what are the charges? You know, it's firearms, it's drug trafficking, it's proceeds of crime. Um, th the main ones you can, you know, Google my name and look it up and it's there, but I'm not going to say more than what's out there. One day when I come out and it's all done, we can go into the like. Hopefully it's not three years. Yeah, hopefully it's not. But I'm working on a big project right now, which is part of No Plan B events, which is working on bringing um, Manny Pacquiao down. Yeah, cool. Um, and doing like an event, like a one-on-one -on -one with him and keynotes, like interviewing him and doing charity stuff and these things. And, you know, it's, it's moving, it's working. I'm currently trying to – I've put it forward to my lawyers and – like, hey, man, can I travel to the fields to go and finalise this deal because they want me over there to to go through the details and potentially close this deal, which one, would make me a bit of money and two, would give back to the economy. I don't know, you know, writing, you know, just trying to do some like, positive, kicks, shit, yeah. positive stuff and kick some goals, which is definitely what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go into that soon, you know, so hopefully I get some good news in the next couple of days and prosecution doesn't oppose it and they allow me to travel and get this deal done before your sentence yeah yeah just before yeah, you know wow. which which they might not they might look at it as like oh jace is trying to run or whatever but no one's running from three to five years bro you know like that's not like you know uproot my life and not take care of my mum and like again no one's running from five three years bro so yeah hopefully i, I get to go close that deal come back show them that it's for real you know i'll have contracts pictures with Manny this that and you know maybe the judge goes you know all right maybe you know do we just want to lock this guy up for three years I mean the guy he's been kicking goals for the last three years it's all I've been focused on mm. is just doing what I started doing you know and going back to what I knew what was you know the right thing to do and I'm doing that you know so 
hopefully, you know, that takes off and that will feed into the digital marketing stuff and that will help open doors for music. And I'm just seeing this all as I've got to build my own platforms. Mm. I've got to build our own pathways because no one's going to do it for us. Like how many people from the hood are going to build that? Yeah. The only person that I'm really seeing is, is Spanian, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's like we, we need our own platforms. We need our own um, way to monetize our neck of the woods, you know. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah, man. And uh, I guess it's daunting knowing that you're going to spend a, a stretch inside. But as long as you've got a plan and you're a very driven dude, you can use that time wisely, you know? Yeah, bro. I mean, I look at it as like I've seen a lot of people go to jail and who you would think won't do good in jail and they do well. You know, it's, it's, it's different here, man. It's not, you know, if this was the California state prison system, it, it'd be really bad. You know, you've got to join a gang. You've got to do these things. But, you know, you can go to prison and put your head down and just do your own thing you know for the most part and so you know i've i'm like man i need to keep myself busy i'm just gonna go in become a machine physically and read and work and write and just treat it like a boot camp man like mm -hmm. you know for the first couple of months it was a bit shattering because it's like man i've just ruined my whole life like i worked so hard to like get here like so far away from where I was to just return there because it's so easy to, you know, when you're still surrounded by it, you know, like that's the other thing that people don't get credit for in terms of like, like if you're an addict and you're, it's like a daily struggle. I'm not an addict, but I understand what addiction is in terms of like, you've got to say no every day, so, yeah. especially if you're around people. People are trying to pull you back in, man. It's very easy. Mm. Right. And so there's, there's no credit given to those people that continuously say, no, you know, if you were clean for three years, but then like you slipped at three and a half and then, you know, now you're back into it. It's like, yeah, but I mean, you know, did well for that amount of time. So for me, it's like that was shattering. Like that shattered me, you know, and I, I've never really hit rock bottom until then. But, you know, I got back up. It was like two months, three months. Rube, Rube's passed away in that as well. So Ruben died. So that doubled down on that. And I kind of felt responsible for that because he got arrested with me and locked up basically with me kind of thing and he didn't do anything end up passing away in the system and you know i, f I felt guilty for that um well, Ruben, for people that don't know had been in and out of fair yeah yeah he'd his be, he'd, priors probably weren't reflecting. Yeah. yeah 100 percent. he'd be like that was my first time yeah, that was like his you know 20th time yeah so you know yeah that didn't help <laughs> didn't didn't help him at all but you know that i just thought you know i gotta do what i always do is just turn the negative into a positive and what else is there to do like you're down, but you're not out, Chase. You know, you're not dead. It's like basketball. It's like, all right, we're losing. We're down by 15, 20 at the half. But we can come back. Like we can. This is like, there's no reason why you can't. Like the game's not over. Mm -hmm. You know, so having that winning mentality of like, this ain't over. It's over if you say it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you quit right now, it's definitely, you can't lose if you don't quit. You know, and then that's, I've just never been a quitter. And like, as long as I am not quitting, then I'm in the game, mm -hmm. you know, and it's only half time. It's only half time. And because those things have come true for basketball in terms of like mad comebacks and we thought we were out of it and like, it's true. You can, this can you could turn this whole thing around and you see it in professional sports all the time. Like, man, they came back. That was unbelievable. You got to believe it. That's how it starts. So for me, it's just turning that into a like, you know what, this is like, what, 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 what would be the difference if I was, you know, constructed? is it conscription or whatever like when you go to war or whatever yeah, yeah. if i was to go to war for three years you know and like couldn't see my family and same thing or if i was just to move to a different country mm -hmm. like let's say i went to philippines for three years whatever all right i don't have the freedom but like this is just a boot camp yep go in make the most of it you can look at it two ways this is sucks and this is fucking horrible or you can say this is a, i'm going to turn this negative into the biggest positive i fucking can 100 percent and Exactly. You can, you've got two choices, sit and mope and be like, this is the worst thing ever, which is absolutely not beneficial and is going to destroy you 100%. Or you can choose to go, nah, I'm going to make this into something because the other option is not an alternative. Mm -hmm. And I'm absolutely going to, what is, what do I want my story to be? My story is, is that Jace went through this thing, fought through all of these obstacles, where he came from, thought he was kind of going to make it pandemic hits 
ruins his fucking life nearly. He hits rock bottom. He gets locked up. He's facing three to five or 10 years even more. What does he do? He turns this whole thing around. He goes to jail we, and comes out the other side richer, physically fitter, mentally better. This guy comes out a machine. This guy goes through the system and he does like – this guy went and did exactly what no one thought he was going to do. And if I can do that, and that's motivating because I'm like, you know what, bring it on then. Yeah. Like if I can't, if this is coming at me anyway, let's do it. Like we've got to do this, you know. So I'm not shying away from it. And I think if I can do that, which I fucking will, is that that can serve as anybody else that's going through this right now. Yep. People on bail. It's hard, man, on the mental, knowing that, oh, man, I've got to face this time. You know, I'm reminded all the time when I go sign in Monday and Friday. You know, that's an unspoken thing because people change, bro. People do well. Like, people change, mm. right? They might be living their life. I know a guy that was like on bail for like several years, six or seven years, and then he got sentenced to like 10 years or something. Mm. Had family, work, this, that. And it's like, come on, man. And the guy's changed like everything. He, like, and now he's, you know, like, in detention and he's getting deported and it's like the guy's a great guy and it's like I'm like come on man like look like this shouldn't just be a blanket thing mm. you know everyone deserves second third fourth fifth every chance. case is different every case is different you know and coming down to like christian stuff it's like you know god forgives us all the time man and it's we don't deserve that and it's like if you're willing to just change and do the right thing and sincerely do that like you should be given that opportunity you know, um, and I'm a big believer in that. So I'm big on forgiveness. I'm big on not allowing mistakes to define who you are. You know, like I'm not going to allow, because when you're in court, the prosecution is like making you out to be the worst dude, you know, That's your fucking job. firearms, guns, drug trafficking, such a, this guy was a kingpin, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, man, I'm not, like, I'm not this. Like, I'm not going to, this is not going to define me. You know, this is a moment in my life, a small blip you know, and I'm not going to be this like one loss in the season of my life to define me. No, I'm going to go do a three-peat. That's what I'm going to do, you know. So, you know, when you're being told you're that, especially when you're growing up, teachers, this, that, sometimes you just buy into that. Yeah, maybe I am that. I'm just a thug. I'm just a gangster and that's all I'll ever be, you know, because that's what you're hearing. But it's like, nah, man, you don't have to be that. You know, you can be whatever you want to be. You just got to, you got to work hard. You got to change your environment. You got to educate yourself. You got to, hang around better people you gotta like remove yourself from certain things there's a lot of things that need to be done it's not easy but it's worth it man mm. you know and what's the alternative you know there isn't one you know especially what's the chase? yeah if you just stay here that's your alternative if, yeah you know it's like like if that's what you want if you just go down this path this is just only going to be this if you're not going to change it it's not going to change itself so you know i'm, I'm big on that stuff Man, if anyone can turn a negative experience into a positive one out of sheer willpower, I think you can do it, dude. 100% willpower, you know, and that's what I've been – because I've been plugging into like David Goggins re recently and Huberman. Yeah, yeah, They were yeah. talking about like willpower and doing things you don't want to do and it grows this uh, – Makes you stronger. Cortex in your brain, which actually is a thing now. So when you do things you don't want to do, it grows this part of your brain, which makes it – not easier, but you'll do do things. Mm -hmm. People who are just really lazy and don't do the things, it's very small in their brain. So it's like they find it even harder. So it's a physical attribute that changes within you. That's right. Yeah. And it's even more when it's a physical thing. So, so like, you're building resilience essentially. Yeah. And they've linked it to willpower and even like the will to live, mm -hmm. right? Like to fight. So it's like this thing must be big in there so or maybe that's why my head's massive so, <laughs> you know. man i'm gonna lock you in as soon as you get out that's comes on uh, to come back and yeah. tell us about it as soon the week that 100 percent, man because i want to hear the story yeah we man. don't know whether it's going to be i'm gonna journal months. that's why i'm like i'm gonna journal like i'm just gonna yeah. write because i'm like this is content yeah you know like i've got to turn this into like this is gonna be content, man. Mm. Like, stories, my own stories. stories and, yeah, you know, we don't. Yeah, as soon as you, as soon as you are able to, man, come back in and let's chat again. Hundred um, percent. We've spoken for almost three hours, dude, and it's been a good chat. Yeah, and bro. We've hardly three had hours had already. Three hours. There's definitely got to be like part ones, two, threes, <laughs> fours. Hundred percent, bro. Sort of stuff. I'm gonna be a regular guest. <laughs> That's it, man. Yeah, and yeah. I look forward to seeing your own content when you eventually can make it. But uh, 
Man, we'll probably wrap it up. Do you want to have any final things to say? Shout out any stuff that you want to shout out and let Just people know? Sh- yeah, shout out to, you know, my label, No Plan B. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm going to be doing the Paid in Full podcast. That's what it's called. Paying homage to hip-hop culture, street culture and entrepreneurship. Um, we'll have like roundtable stuff as well as like more Vlad TV one-on-one stuff. Definitely want to get you on it. Awesome. All types of people, yeah, you know, just, you know, whatever they can offer to because it's, you know, coming from where I come from, it's like, here, yeah, you know, here's some information that you might be able to use to better yourself, personal development. Um, but yeah, you know, you can follow me at uh, Little Jace, uh, L-I-T-T-L-E-J-A-S-E. Um, but yeah, man, shout out to everybody who's ever supported me, who's ever backed me um everyone that sends me messages to just you know about my music and to keep going and i understand that a lot of people supporting me right now through um you know the the challenge that awaits me um but yeah and shout out to you bro for you know allowing me to come on the podcast and share my story yeah always well little jace thanks for coming man we'll speak again soon i'm sure i appreciate it man and i wish you all the best in your tough times ahead thanks brother i appreciate it Cheers. 3,000.